Josh Coast Live. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This session of the Appellate Division is now open. I'm about to call the calendar. I'm going to call the cases as well as tell you the time that's been allotted for oral argument. <clears throat> the first case on the calendar is People versus Stephen Nunes. The appellant has six and two minutes for rebuttal. The respondent has been allotted six minutes. Clayson versus Williams. The appellant has five and two for rebuttal. The respondent has five minutes. People versus Christopher R is marked submitted. Locke versus US, URS Architecture. The, give me, the appellant URS is granted five and two. The respondent lock is, is granted five. The respondent tri-rail is granted five and respondent appellant crescent is granted five and two. 544 Bloomrest versus Harding. The appellant is granted five and two. The respondent has five minutes. Aquafreda Enterprises versus Sterling Bank. The appellant has five and two for rebuttal. Each of the respondents has five minutes. O'Flaherty versus Colombo. The appellant has five and two for rebuttal. The cross appellant has the same five and two. People versus Molina. The appellant has four and one. The people have four. Campisi versus Shea. The appellant has five and two. The respondent has five. Sanchez versus the Department of Education. The appellant has five and two. The respondent has five. People versus Holmes is Mark submitted. Certain underwriters versus NL Industries. The appellant has five and two. The respondent has five. People versus Justin Coleman. The appellant has four and one. The respondent has four. Guzman versus Americare. The appellant has six and two. The respondent has six. Meckler versus Molnar is marked submitted. Diamond versus WWP office is marked submitted. Sotheby's versus Shawaki. The appellant has five and two and the respondent has five. We call the first case on the calendar, People versus Stephen Nunez. Good morning, Your Honors. Or good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Joseph Nursey representing Stephen Nunez. Stephen Nunez's defense at his trial for robbery is that no robbery was committed, that it was a fabrication by the um, complainant. His co-defendant, uh, Manuel Custodio, his defense um, was that he was mistakenly identified, but it wasn't simply a situation where he came in and said, I didn't do it, I wasn't there, I don't know what happened. The argument that his attorney made was very different. The argument that his attorney made was that he was so trauma that he was traumatized, something that caused him great trauma had happened, and because of that trauma, he was not able to make an accurate identification. And the only trauma that there was evidence of in the trial was the robbery that was accused. So his defense was in irreconcilable conflict with the defense of Stephen Nunez. And it became more explicit during the custodio's summation where he re repeatedly referred to the robbery as a given fact, saying that, saying that my client was not there when the robbery occurred. In fact, he went so... Excuse me. He went so far as to argue, the um, custodial's lawyer went so far as to argue, we're not saying that the complainant is trying to trick you or that the complainant is a terrible person. Well, that was exactly St Stephen Nunez's defense. Mr. Mercy, this is Justice Moulton. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, the references to robbery by custodial's attorney, were there any that were not quotations of 
witnesses from the case? Yes, yes. He, he, he at, at times, especially when he was talking about the so-called second cell phone, he would say that that cell phone was by the robbery. And he kept referring to the to whoever was having that cell phone was in the location of the robbery. It was not simply repeating something that the complainant had said. He he said it in in the divorced from any witness. He said that this phone was by the robbery and kept referring to the robbery uh, affirmatively. And when he said that um, that the complainant's not trying to trick you and he's not a terrible person, that's exactly what Stephen Nunez's um, defense was, that he was trying to trick them, that he had fabricated a, a robbery, and that he was a terrible person because he was falsely counsel, accusing. Counsel, yes. when you look through, is there anywhere in the record where custodial's counsel ever made the argument that your client was actually the one who committed the robbery or implicated your client as someone who committed the robbery and anything that was said? Uh, directly, directly said it, no. Implicated it, yes. He, oh. he, he, made, he made a point in both his opening statement and in his summation saying Stephen Nunez was caught at the scene. He was identified at the scene, and he but used did he that. Say he committed a robbery. That's different to say he was at the scene because wasn't his position that it was not a robbery. When he when he was referring to a traumatic event that occurred to the complainant that made it where the complainant could not make a correct identification, the only traumatic event he possibly could have been referring to is the robbery. That's the only traumatic offense that was in evidence at the trial. And in summation, he. he he started by talking about the credibility of the complainant, but by the end of the summation, he was repeatedly referring to a robbery as if it were a given, as if it was something that occurred. And Stephen Nunez's defense was there wasn't a robbery. Uh, counsel, yes. uh, didn't uh, defense counsel also indicate, uh, and I'm talking about for Claudio, that he wasn't going to repeat certain things because defense counsel made good points. He, he was agreeing with what defense counsel uh, said. That he they, made good points. Both attorneys argued that uh, that um, the complainant was not credible and that he couldn't be believed, but they argued it for different reasons. The, the uh, Mr. Nunez's attorney was arguing the complainant cannot be believed because he was fabricating the whole thing, that a robbery didn't occur, that this incident involved an illegal gambling operation. Whereas Custodio was saying he's not credible in making an identification of my client as being the person who was there. Um, but didn't uh, counsel for the co-defendant co also... Oh, let me do that again. Uh, didn't uh, counsel... The co-defendant co also, also even asked whether a robbery even occurred. He, he started his summation by, by telling the jury the first thing you have to look at is whether a robbery even occurred. There, there, don't, don't question they argued that. But then he, he, he argued further, though, as if a robbery had occurred. And he talked about things like how scared the complainant was, how the complainant's heart was racing, how he, he probably couldn't remember what was going on. All of those things point to that he was he was scared because he was robbed. And the and Mr. Nunez's defense was he he wasn't robbed, that he was completely fabricating this. There was no way to reconcile the, the arguments that Custodio made both in opening statement and in his summation with the defense that Mr. Nunez was presented at trial. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's hear from the people. Good afternoon, your honors. Um, Elizabeth Schmidt for the people. Um, defendant's motion for severance was properly denied because his defense simply did not conflict with that of his co-defendants. Um, as your honors brought out, um, although defendant claims otherwise now, his co-defendant's attorney actually asserted repeatedly to the jury that no robbery had ever occurred. And that was the same defense that defendant raised at trial. Um, he explicitly stated that no robbery had occurred. And he also explicitly stated 
that the victim's testimony Counsel, was this is Judge um, how, do, how do you respond to uh, your adversary's uh, position that by referring to a traumatic event that he must have by necessity have been referring to the robbery? Again, Your Honor, first I would cite to counsel's most explicit statement, which was that no robbery had occurred. Um, although counsel, or rather that defendant is now arguing that counsel was implying that a robbery had occurred, he explicitly stated only that no robbery had ever occurred. Um, beyond that, I do believe that those uh, references were just uh, a recital of the witness's testimony. They were not an endorsement of that narrative because he said repeatedly that that witness was lying. Um, if really this case lands just in the ambit of Funches, it and if nothing else, it's even less contestable. Uh, in Funches, as is here, uh, that defendant argued that no robbery had occurred, whereas his co-defendant argued that he had been misidentified. Here, those are the same arguments launched by the two defendants, except here, as I noted, the co-defendant also argued explicitly that no robbery had ever occurred. Therefore, the arguments that the defendants launched were entirely compatible. There was no conflict between them, and defendant's case was pro defendant was properly tried with his co-defendant. If there are no further questions, uh, we ask that this court affirm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nursey. Rebuttal. Yes, uh, Funches is not comparable to this case. In Funches, there's no indication at all in that case that the co-defendant argued that something terrible happened to the complainant that made him misidentify me. He simply said, he, he gave the traditional mistaken identity. I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. That's entirely different from what happened in this case. And um, as, as far as the, uh, the co-defendant's counsel arguing that the complainant was not telling the truth, he did say those words. That was part of the start of his summation. But then he moved into the, this argument that basically assumed a robbery occurred and said that the the complainant was greatly traumatized and the only traumatizing event was a robbery. I think that um, the um, prejudice to um, to Mr. Nunez can be seen in in the way the jury reached the verdict. The jury was was deadlocked as to all charges against Custodio. Whereas the jury was deadlocked on, on Stephen Nunez on robbery displaying what appeared to be a firearm, but convicted on robbery while aided by another. If they believed that he was convicted of robbery, while, if they believe he committed robbery while aided by another, and that other, in, in terms of the verdict they were reaching, was not custodial, it means that the jury accepted, at least, or at least some of the jurors accepted, at least to some extent, the argument that custodial's attorney was making. And, and to me, that the very nature of the deliberations indicates that custodial, the presentation that custodial made was damaging to Stephen Nunez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. The next case on the calendar is Clayson versus Williams. Good morning, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honors. My name is Claire Rush, and I'm here today on behalf of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, its various subdivisions, as well as the bus operator, uh, Eugene Williams. As Your Honors know, this is a tragic case that occurred on uh, August 14th, 2015, in the vicinity of a bus stop located on Madison Avenue between 72nd and 73rd Street. Together with our papers, we've submitted a copy of a videotape which shows the accident. This videotape was provided to the uh, parties by the New York City Police Department, and it shows, in essence, what happened that day. Counsel, this is Justice Moulton. I'm sorry to yes. interrupt. You. The uh, the video, which we've all watched, does show the plaintiff coming from the right side or to the right of the bus toward the bus on sort of a right angle, at a 90 degree angle. However, she also testified that she hit the side of the bus with her hand, the way we commonly see in New York City when a passenger wants the bus driver to stop so they can board the bus. Um, should the, is that sufficient to create an issue of tribal fact that the bus driver should have been aware from the banging on the side of the bus <clears throat> that there was somebody near the wheels of the bus? 
Well, Your Honor, I think that that sort of begs the question, with all due respect, about uh, what was going on there at that time. If we take a look at the time uh, at the time uh, frame that was there, we see that at uh, 1640, 10, 1640, a male passenger gets on the bus. We see the plaintiff behind the bus walking directly in the middle of the street down. At 6.43, we see the bus operator close the doors. We see the plaintiff at that point, rather than going towards the curb, we see her going towards the building lot. Then we see her at 6.44, the bus operator releases the brakes, and the plaintiff takes three more steps towards the building line at that point. The bus operator has testified that he looked in each mirror, didn't see anything at that time, and then pursuant to proper regulations, he began to move out into the traffic in order to uh, fulfill his obligations as a, tr as a bus driver. His obligation at that point, Your Honor, was to take a look at what was going on to the left of him. Now, let's look now at what happens at 645. You haven't, you haven't responded see, to what I asked you about the beating on the side of the bus. I mean, if, but if the, that... beating of, the beating at the side of the bus, Your Honor, starts at, at 640, at 648. That is when the first contact is made. And that is made, Your Honor, after the bus starts to move. When you look at the uh, video, you see that the bus starts to move at 645. You see that uh, the plaintiff, uh, thereafter uh, starts to move towards the bus. The bus is moving north, and then at 648, the, the plaintiff now steps off of the position of safety uh, and uh, where she's at. Well, the bus is moving north and starting to move west, and then, and then according to her, taps the bus in the area of a window near the rear, uh, rear doors of the bus. That is what happens. This woman put herself into a position, into an incredibly dangerous position. This is not a situation, Your Honor, where we have a bus that is stopped at an at a bus stop, but it is a bus that is moving. That is a clear and present danger to all people that would try and get on that bus. And to this extent, Your Honor, I would claim that this case is really indistinguishable from the second Council, court this is this is Judge Price. Rodriguez. I have, yes, I have a Judge. question for you. Yes, Judge. What are we to do with the uh, with the report by Walter Arlovsky, if I, if I pronounce that correctly, the safe the safety training officer, and also the uh, uh, the report by uh, the plaintiff's expert that that says that after watching the video that the bus driver should have seen uh, should have seen the victim. What do we do with okay. that? Well, Your Honor, first of all, I would I would say to you that with respect to the Orlovsky uh, decision, it was made very, very clear that 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 uh, report was generated pursuant to the New York City Transit Authority's rules and regulations. And when you take a look at that uh, at that part of the record, you'll see that at the bottom of that report is a notation that the report was generated pursuant to the higher standard. The higher standard, that's true. So therefore, Montez, uh, under Montez, that that uh, wouldn't be inadmissible and should not be have been considered by the court uh, on the motion for summary judgment. And I would say the same thing with respect to uh, Mr. Jenna. With all due respect, Mr. Jenna's report is replete with uh, mischaracterizations of the of what transpired that day. The fact of the matter is in this case that uh, this plaintiff was in a position of safety, whether it was due to her intoxication, she made a terrible uh, decision, but a decision, Your Honor, that was made voluntarily by herself. She is, she, uh, you referred to her as a victim. And with all due respect, I think that she uh, is, uh, she put herself in that position. It wasn't like the bus operator, uh, you know, went on top of the sidewalk and ran her over. No, she came out and put herself into a moving, into this, into the street with a moving bus that she knew was moving away. And we also know something else, Your Honor, from these yeah, various Ms. reports. Rush, your yes. time has expired, so sorry. I'm going to ask you to finish okay. up, and you'll okay. have some time on rebuttal. I'm sorry. Thank you, Your Honor. No, I would you don't just have say... to apologize. We're all working off my cell phone. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll <laughs> defer to my, uh, to my colleague. Thank you so much okay. for your time and attention. Thank you. 
All right, uh, respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Jillian Rosen for the plaintiff respondent. I'm going to try to answer all these questions within five minutes. Um, well, Ms. Rosen, let me let me start sure. you with a question. And you know what? We did all look at the videotape, and the question is: Did the plaintiff bang on the bus before the bus started moving? Well, she testifies at 257 of the record that she is banging on the bus while simultaneously with the doors closing. But let's assume, and Mr. Jenna doesn't disagree that the, the bus is inching forward, but that doesn't relieve the bus operator from his testimony. Actually, he is supposed to look left, look right. And if there is someone standing to the right, he's supposed to then stop the bus look to the right and then let the passenger in. So there is a question as to whether she's banging at the same time, but that doesn't obviate his duty, his own testimony under the common law. We'll get to this, this claim that it's, 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 it's more than the common law, it, it isn't. But if you look at the video, you see that the bus driver, and just with all due respect to my adversary, she can't discredit Mr. Jenna. Mr. Jenna is an expert, they didn't put in an expert, so Ms. Rush can't discredit Mr. Jenna's opinion. Mr. Jenna opined, if you look at the still videos, and he goes in detail, step by step, you see at 637 of the record, she is close to the bus, and the bus is parallel to the curb, and she's banging, and she's banging until Council, let me ask you a question. Yeah. You say we can't discredit his testimony, but if his testimony is inconsistent with what is plainly visible on the video itself, can't we then discredit his testimony? Because we all looked at the video and it appears from looking at the video that she did not start have any contact with the bus in any way until the bus already was pulling out. You know, well, she didn't, there's no way she was anywhere near the bus before the bus started pulling out, just looking at the video. So if his, if his expert testimony is based on a position that's inconsistent with the video, uh, can't we disregard it under those circumstances? I don't think so, because if you look at 640 of the record, she is reaching out. That's a still shot, and she's reaching out while the bus is inching up very slowly, but it's not moving into traffic because there's a taxi cab to the left. And he also opines that even if the bus is inching forward, the bus driver has an obligation if he sees her to stop the bus. And here's where I just want to focus quickly, is that the transit authority, Stewart and Mastillo, got on the bus and said that the mirrors were misaligned and he should have been in the field of vision, that, that she should have been in the field of vision so that the bus driver would have seen her and heard the banging and stopped the bus before he continued to merge into traffic, which was after she was being pulled by the bus and fell down. And another thing I want to point out, so, so to your answer to your question is, I don't think the video is clear to show that it's not like the bus is pulling into traffic and she's over and she's far away from the bus. She is right next to the bus and the bus is parallel to the sidewalk while she's banging on it. And our expert says, had the mirrors been properly aligned and had the bus driver who admittedly failed to see her before he ran over her legs, saw her in the properly aligned mirrors, he would have stopped as he was supposed to do and opened the bus. Bus driver Williams testified that was the something. Looking at the video, even let's say the bus driver did see her, which I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying I agree with that, but even if the bus driver did see her, looking at the video, is she walks up to the bus and then she's under the bus. Like it's almost simultaneous. So how how would the bus driver, even if he saw her, had avoided, since it happened pretty much simultaneously, as she approached it, she went under it. Well, can, Judge Kern, can I please point out, I don't know if you have the still photographs with you right now or on yeah, the line. Still, but why is that more accurate than the video, which is a continuous moving it's representation of what occurred. It's not more accurate, but what I'm saying to you is if you look at 637, which is a still shot of the video, Mr. Jenna opines that had the bus operator looked in the mirrors, she would have been visible at this point. And if you see where she is, she's next to the bus. And that goes up until pages 647. She is next to the bus. And if the bus driver had properly aligned mirrors and saw what he should have seen, he would have seen her and stopped the bus to let her on. One other thing I want to point now, out. You're saying if there's ever a person standing next to a bus, even if they're not trying to get on the bus, the bus driver should assume they're trying to get on the bus? She was banging on the bus. It shows her banging on the bus. So he should have 
seen her in the mirror, heard the banging, and actually he takes his foot off the brake and five seconds elapse before he tries to even merge into traffic, which Mr. Jenis said was sufficient amount of time to see her and stop the bus and let her on. But one last thing. Wait, counsel, are you, are you saying that the five seconds elapsed from the time that she allegedly banged on the bus to the time that the bus pulled out into traffic? No, what I'm saying is Mr. Jenna opines that five seconds elapsed between the time that the bus, this was, so it's more than five seconds, five seconds elapsed between the time he takes his foot off the brake and the time that she's rolling under the bus. So there was time to see her and stop the bus when he heard the banging, that she was banging repeatedly and the pictures show it and the video shows it, and the jury should decide whether there was sufficient time. But Mr. Jenna opines that given the time frame and given the video and given what the field of vision was in the mirrors, she should have been, she was visible. And Ms. Stillo and Stewart sat on the bus and said these mirrors are improperly aligned, but the center mirror wasn't. And here's the key. Counsel, the I have a question. Ms. Uh, Ms. Yeah, Ms. Ms. Rosen, you're going to have to finish up your argument, okay. but I think we have another question sure. for you. Yeah. So, so when you talk about Stewart and, and Ms. Stillo, um, they also said that they mistakenly was under the impression that uh, the plaintiff was running, well, excuse me, I should say approaching uh, alongside the bus, which not what the video shows. The video shows she was on the sidewalk. She went to uh, the left. The bus was in the roadway, and certainly the plaintiff even testified that the video was an accurate depiction of the incident. Yes, Your Honor, but the video shows that she's right next to the bus before it pulls out into the lane and she's banging and also the repudiation of the testimony. It doesn't change the fact that they that the that the incident reports, the, the transit investigation reports and the testimony was that the mirror was misaligned. And if they're going to repudiate and say it's not misaligned, that's even better for me because it shows that they, he failed to see what should have been seen and through the well, center no, nobody, mirror. Nobody said they weren't misaligned, but that it didn't have anything to do with the accident. Well, it, but, it, but okay, we understand. Well, the failure to miss a lot. Let's, we have to hear from your adversary in terms of rebuttal now. Okay, Your Honor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I really have uh, nothing uh, further to add to uh, the argument unless the uh, court has any questions other than to make the following uh, observation. And that is that in order to accept the plaintiff's position, there it would essentially require the New York City Transit Authority bus operators to assume that any pedestrian on a sidewalk in the vicinity of a stop might make an unexpected last minute beeline for a bus. And this argument was actually considered, and unfortunately, I didn't uh, uh, find this case uh, when I was preparing the brief, and a case called uh, Rucker versus uh, Fifth Avenue Coach Lines, the uh, appellate division uh, site, which is what the Court of Appeals uh, cited to, is uh, 1982D598. And in that case, the uh, court was, uh, was confronted with a, uh, incident in which someone was standing out in the street waiting for uh, uh, and the argument of the plaintiff was that the uh, was that the vehicle should have stopped because the person was in the street and uh, Max Stoyer writing for the uh, I'm sorry not Max Stoyer his son Aaron Stoyer writing for the first department came out and said in that case that uh, this argument would undoubtedly so disrupt traffic, streets would become well nigh unusable for vehicles. And that's in essence, I think what we're talking about here as well. The uh, no New York City transit bus, no common carrier would be able to move on, this, on the streets. And I think that this case falls clearly within Ryan. And I would ask uh, your honors uh, to reverse the decision below and dismiss this complaint. Thank you very much for your time. And I'll stop Thank now. You both. Thank you. The next case for argument is Locke versus URS. Um, good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, there's two appellants on this case. Would you like? Yeah, I think URS is the first appellant, though, right? Okay. And Crescent next. It's just the way you filed your briefs, so we'll do it that way. So let's hear from Mr. Meskel, I believe, is, is on by phone. He was having some trouble. I believe he is on by video now, but he's. Yes, oh, I see him. Okay, Mr. Meskel. 
Thank you very Go much. Go ahead. You have five Thank minutes. You. Thank you, uh, Your Honor. I represent the URS entities in this case, and the decision of the lower court should be reversed, and this uh, plaintiff's action against URS should be dismissed for two reasons. One, URS is not a, a, a defendant, a proper defendant under sections 200, 241, or 241.6 of the New York State labor law because they are not an owner, a contractor, or an agent of the owner. And second- Let me ask you, counsel, why yes. can't it be deemed an agent of the owner based on its clear ability under the relevant um, contracts to designate which bathroom should be used at the premises? It did de designate which bathroom should be used. It knew that there were problems with that bathroom, was very aware of those problems, and did not use its authority to change the bathrooms that were being used, despite being aware of the issues. Why isn't that enough uh, as to the agency issue? Well, Your Honor, the, the only that's the only factor that was considered by the court. The, the court ignored the fact that URS didn't have any authority to contract with other parties. In fact, the other parties in the case are prime contractors. URS didn't have any authority. Right, but to why control. isn't that by itself enough? The fact that it had the ability to designate the bathroom and change the bathroom, and despite being aware of the ongoing and severe problems with the bathroom, didn't make the change. Why isn't that by itself enough to um, create agency liability? Because that does not evidence that they are directing or controlling the means and methods of the work being performed at the site. They, they merely suggested that the bathroom or allowed this bathroom to be used. And, Your Honor, when they did that. Uh, yeah, this is Judge Gish. I just want to stop you there because yes. you mentioned means and methods. If this was a dangerous condition uh, situation, does the analysis change? Well, it, was, it, it may, Your Honor. And I was going to point out that the court below, I think, confused the issues. But in this case, the dangerous condition arose because of tri rails work. When when the designation was made, there was nothing wrong with the base, with the bathroom. The bathroom deteriorated over the course of time when the project was ongoing. It's clear that TriRail had the responsibility to maintain and even to repair the bathroom, and they were instructed to do so by URS. But let and me ask something. Even though they had the, clearly, it was their responsibility to uh, to keep the bathroom clean. Wasn't there an equal responsibility on the part of your client? to designate a bathroom and redesignate another bathroom if there was a problem with that bathroom. Well, Your Honor, there's nothing in the record that indicates that there was another bathroom available to be redesignated. There's no-, no th Excuse me, this is Judge Gish again. I thought there was evidence in the record that on the fourth floor, there were other bathrooms and they were padlocked because your client designated this particular bathroom. That's that's right, but that this is the. At so the time, why weren't they available to be designated? I don't understand that. Because those were for other contractors and other trades. The padlocked bathrooms, really? Yes, that's what the testimony was. Yes, that they were reserved for other contractors and other trades. Going back to the issue of of um, URS, simply designating a bathroom. If the, if the court holds that the URS is an agent of the owner simply because it designated a bathroom. That would be the first time that any such determination was made. In every other so case- if, for Counsel, if the bathroom is a dangerous condition, which there's evidence in the record that your client was aware it was dangerous and continued to, uh, with that designation, why isn't that sufficient? Well, Your Honor, respectfully, I think you're putting the cart before the horse. When, when my client designated the bathroom, there was no defect with the bathroom. But it knew, knew, it knew, it was totally in the loop. It wasn't like it designated the bathroom and it, then it had no further knowledge of what was going on at the site. It was completely aware of the ongoing problems and was trying to actually do something about it and was involved in trying to get it corrected. That's correct. And as the construction <laughs> manager, URS was trying to get the appropriate party, TriRail, who was responsible for the bathroom, who was responsible to maintain and repair the bathroom at its own cost and expense. URS was trying to get TriRail to do their job and to maintain the bathroom. Well, Your Honor, I just want also, before my time runs out, I'd like to address the issue of, of uh, URS's claim for contractual indemnification against TriRail. TriRail argues that it was not negligent and therefore the, the contractual indemnification is not triggered. However, 
Tri-Rail was found by the court below to have been negligent in failing to do the job they were supposed to do and, and in so doing was negligent and their negligence was the proximate cause of the plaintiff's accident. That's the law of the case. They can't now come back and argue, well, we weren't negligent. They were negligent. They are negligent. They're negligent for the rest of this case because they didn't perfect an appeal. So they, 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 are, they are bound by the determination of the court below. Since they were negligent, we you under Mr. Mesco, you're out of time. I'm sorry. But we understand the argument about the, the indemnification. We understand your point. Let's hear from Crescent because they're the, the other appellant next. Good afternoon, your honors. May I please the court. My name is Miriam Suleiman and I represent Crescent Contracting Corporation defendant appellant. Your honor, this case is about ensuring that labor law 200 and the case law interpreted is correctly applied where there's no factual evidence to show Crescent Contracting Corporation, a subcontractor hired to perform plumbing work on certain bathrooms at the project site had any responsibilities towards the work in its bathroom at issue or control over plaintiff Mr. Lockheed's work at the job site. There's no question of fact through evidence and witness testimony that Crescent's scope of work was ever expanded to work on the workman's bathroom. The record clearly shows that Crescent had a plumbing contract to work on certain bathrooms that did not include the workman's bathroom. URS designated a workman's bathroom that was not part of Crescent's contract to work on, and Tri-Rail was responsible for cleaning and maintaining the bathroom. Yeah, we understand that this is Judge Gish, but there was some documentation in the record that indicated that uh, your client was going to inspect the shanty bathrooms. Why isn't that at least enough to create an issue of fact about whether your client took on some extra contractual work to otherwise take care of the problem, the, plum the plumbing problem in this bathroom? Yes, Your Honor, I understand. But in order for the original contract to expand on the two, to for my client to inspect the two additional bathrooms, there needs to be an additional supplemental contract, which will be a work contract or additional order to come in. And there's no evidence or documentary evidence stated by any of the parties that my client had the responsibility or work to check on the two additional bathrooms. Your honors, also Mr. Lockie's testimony, he stated that he observed a trial rail worker cleaning on numerous occasions the leaking problem in the bathroom. He also made complaints to URS and the trial tri rail to fix the leak, uh, leaking sink in the bathroom. A URS formally requested that Tri-Rail clean and repair the bathroom as it is part of the evidence in the record. There's no documents or deposition testimony that show that Crescent had any control over the maintenance or repair of the workman's bathroom. Accordingly, this court should reverse the lower court's decision that denied Crescent's summary judgment as to plaintiff's negligence and labor law claims and Crescent's common law and defecation claims against URS for following three main reasons. First, Crescent is not a proper labor law defendant under labor law section 200 and the claim should be dismissed since as the trial court ruled that under 241 labor law that Crescent was not neither an owner or general contractor or agent for both. Second, Crescent was not hired to perform work in the bathroom. There is no concrete evidence to establish that Crescent had any involvement with or control or responsibility for the bathroom in question. Crescent was neither an owner, general contractor, or agent for both and had a duty or had a duty to repair or maintain the bathroom or control over Mr. Lockie's work. Third, Crescent is not guilty of negligence with regards to Lockie's accident, so there's no question of fact that exists with respect to the scope of Crescent's work on the project. As to my first point, Your Honor, this court in Singh versus Blank Diamond LLC held that the Labor Law 200 is the codification of common law duty of an owner or general contractor. But as indicated earlier, the trial court held that Crescent was neither an owner or general contractor or agent for both. So it did not have the responsibility to provide a hazard-free 
workman's bathroom for Mr. Lockheed to use. Okay, any questions, colleagues? All right, thank you. All right, let's hear from respondent Locke. Yes. Um, can the court hear me? Yes, we can. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ruth Bernstein. I'm attorney of record for the plaintiffs, Michael Locke and Monica Locke. And uh, may it please the court, I would like to begin with uh, URS's appeal and why it needs to be denied. And um, I think uh, defense counsel for URS is a little uh, is confusing the holdings in certain cases and, take, and taking one particular um, way of, of expressing it, wording it. For example, in all the cases, it says that in order for a, a defendant to be held liable as a labor law defendant, there has to be some control over the activity giving rise to the injuries. Um, now, uh, Mr. Mescal, defense counsel for URS have constantly repeated in, in their uh, briefs and uh, here today that, um, that because URS did not have direct control over the work being performed at the site, that they are not a proper labor law defendant. However, that's not the rule. It, it's not, it doesn't define who's a proper labor law defendant based on their level or amount of control that they exercise over all the work that's being done. It's specifically the activity that gave rise to the injuries that is the question. And in this case, URS has admitted that they had the sole authority and obligation pursuant to their contract with the owner. Um, they had the sole uh, authority and obligation to assign bathrooms. Now, counsel for URS is trying to say, well, you assign the bathrooms at the beginning of the work. And, and when we did that, it was safe. But that presumes a, that, um, that their obligation to uh, provide safe operational bathrooms to the workers ended after they first uh, made the assignment. And that's not the case at all. Um, they had an ongoing obligation to review the situation. They had absolute knowledge for over a week prior to Mr. Locks accident. And they also in the email. Counsel, I'm sorry, it's Justice Moulton. Can you respond to URS's point that there were no other bathrooms to substitute? Well, there's no, there's nothing in the evidence that says there were no other bathrooms. Nobody testified that there were no other bathrooms. Mr. Meskel saying it today is the first that we hear that specific point there were no bath there were no other bathrooms there were several bathrooms and they uh they managed to come up with alternate bathrooms um after mr Locke was injured so and uh they said in the uh, in the emails uh the email evidence that um that uh they that they put up a, a barrier so that no one could get hurt anymore. But they had known, I mean, they sent this email around that morning, uh, URS did, which at, at the same time shows their authority and, and uh, power to regulate what goes on as far as safety deficiencies go. And uh, Kenrick Williams of URS called this a safety deficiency that, and, and ordered um, ordered uh, tri-rail to uh, repair it without delay. Um, 
I don't have a timer going here, so I don't. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I, I have the timer and uh, you have 35 seconds. <laughs> okay. Well, I do yeah, want, so to I want you to say... briefly move on and I want you to address the argument with respect to Crescent. Yes. So with Crescent, there was definitely this um, documentation that the court mentioned in its decision. Um, that uh, when, when was that? When, I mean, that documentation doesn't specifically identify this particular bathroom, correct? Well, it, it, I, it that's a yes or no. I, you're it, out of time, it, so I'm it, trying to hasten this for you. I, I it understand. Doesn't, you. It doesn't. We all agree it doesn't. You know, it may refer to a shanty bathroom. Maybe, maybe this refers to the bathroom that the workman used because it was near a shanty. But when was that documentation? When did that take place? That notification um, in relation to the accident or the notification of the defective condition? The notification per per Mr. Locke's testimony, he said that he started complaining about it a month before his accident. According to the um, email train, um, they were uh, a, an email. Ironically, was sent around on the morning of Mr. Locke's accident. That that's not no no. You're not answering my question which is there's this documentation that you're relying on to create an issue of fact that um, that Crescent, even though it didn't have a, a written change order, that it, it was given the responsibility to fix the leak in the bathroom. When wh when is that doc when did that documentation exist? When did that take oh. place relative to the accident? OK, uh, the accident was April 7th of 2011 on Thursday, March 31st, so that's uh, eight days prior, uh, in the daily report, URS wrote concerning Crescent Contracting that their plumbers were fourth floor, were performing fourth floor testing of bulletin three work, and that was a ticket item, and the yeah, but that uh, that that that, you, you that wanna... doesn't necessarily help you. That doesn't refer to a bathroom at all. There's all sorts of plumbing on the floor. So let me get back to my question again. The documentation that seems to be you, your best bet is there was prior documentation basically telling Crescent to do work on the on the on the shanty bathrooms on that floor. When was that? Um, that was prior to um, the 31st, in fact, that they were. Right, of course it was. Again, I'm asking you for data. If you don't know it, that's fine, Ms. Bernstein. I'm going to look it up in the in the, uh, in the in, in, in the record. I think that that's the best use of time. And let's hear from TriRail now. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, we are opposing URS's uh, appeal for contractual indemnification against TriRail. URS is was was negligent here. Um, they they were the ones that. Why shouldn't there be a conditional contractual indemnification? Uh, because as as your opposing counsel stated, there's no question that your client has been held negligent and hasn't appealed. Um, and there has not yet been a determination as to whether um, URS is liable. <clears throat> so why under the circumstances should it, and and it's not your indemnification clause isn't even dependent on uh, negligence. So why shouldn't it be conditional? Because if they're not, if they could still be the sole proximate cause, just because I'm negligent. No, no, no. Because there's already been a finding you're negligent, which you haven't appealed. So right, no matter I, what, your client is going to be responsible because it's undisputed your client was responsible for maintaining the bathroom under the contract. So no matter what, your client's going to be in. It's just a matter of whether they're also in. So isn't that a perfect they, case for that? Conditional? No, because if they are in, the, the jury could still find that their failure to actually fix the pipe issue and the fact that they designated the bathroom and had control over what bathroom to designate um, as evidenced by the fact that they completely shut down that bathroom after the accident occurred shows that they could be just because I'm negligent doesn't mean I'm the proximate cause. So there's a finding of negligence, but that doesn't mean that they might not be held the sole proximate cause. And then I wouldn't be contractually 
I would, I would have. In what case would you ever give conditional contract? If we accept your argument, when, when would there ever be an appropriate case for conditional contractual identification? In the event that they, they aren't negligent. Right, but we don't know that. But if, again, if we follow your argument through, that would, there would never be a, a case for conditional contractual identification. Right? Right. And that, that's all I wanted to point out, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mescal, you have two minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Just very quickly with reference to Tri-Rail's position, they were found to have been the proximate cause of the plaintiff's accident. The court below specifically said that their negligence was a substantial factor in causing the accident. So there's no way that the proximate that, cause issue- the, the court had to. It, it, it gave liability yeah, I, to the plaintiff, like, you know. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, Your Honor, I'll move on. With reference to the plaintiff's uh, statement that it's not necessary for uh, a third party here, the construction manager, um, to actually control the work, and they just have to control the activity that the plaintiff was engaged in at the time of the accident, that's not supported by any of the case law. First of all, Labor Law 241.6 applies to construction-related activity. The plaintiff in this case undisputedly was not involved in any construction activity at the time of the accident. He had finished for the day. Well, I, I don't done. understand. Nobody, nobody was building the bathroom. The bathroom was just there at, because you have to have it when you have work people at the workplace. No, I mean, no. so how can a bathroom ever be considered the part of anybody's work it, under your I, I, kind of I, 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 was, look at it? Well, I, I agree that it's never, it's never part of the construction work. He wasn't performing any construction. So, so then no, so then no, there's no labor law liability at all for this with a bathroom on a construction site is not appropriately uh, provided or maintained for work people, for workers? Well, Can well, that well, be? There well, there certainly would be if they were performing work in the bathroom. The labor law doesn't apply to every situation, as, as the court is well aware. The labor law doesn't provide a remedy to every injured worker. So, the counsel, if Mr. Locke was injured when he was having lunch, that would not be a 241 sub 6 claim? No, it may be. It would be a... Comp a, a common law negligence claim, he'd have a remedy elsewhere, but it wouldn't be involved in 241.6. He's not engaged in construction related activity. 241.6 is very specific. It has to be a worker engaged in construction related activity. And I'd just like to bring the court's attention to Russin against Louis Picciano cited in my brief. That deals with whether or not a construction manager be, can be considered to be an agent of the owner. And, and the court there was very specific. Only upon obtaining the authority to supervise and control the work does the third party fall within the class of those having non-delegable right. liability. Right. We, we have the site. We have the yeah. case. Thank yes. you. We'll, we'll look at it. Thank you very we much. We have looked at it. Okay. Crescent, two minutes. Your Honors, I would like to point out that the project meet, meeting that plaintiff's counsel stated that, that stated that Crescent should check the two Shanity bathrooms. However, the the project meeting isn't a contract or a change of the original contract. In order for a written change order to be issued, as Crescent's president testified in his EBT, and that's part of the record, stated that. So that you, your position is even if that really refers to work that your client was asked to do in the bathroom, it doesn't matter because they don't have the written change order? No, Your Honor, that's not my um Then, then what? My then, I, then I don't understand. Does it create an issue of fact or doesn't it? Uh, no, no, Your Honor, it doesn't create an issue of fact. Clearly, Crescent was only um, job and obligation at the project site was to fix the bathrooms that was part of the contract. The four, four on the fourth floor, of the Pacific bathrooms that were cited as part of the project uh, on the project site, part of the contract, not any other bathrooms. Your Honor. Okay. All right. Anything Thank you, else? Your Honor. All right. Colleagues, any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all Thank this you. afternoon. Okay, the next case is 544 Bloomrest versus Harding. Have any counselors appeared on that? Mr. Moriarty, Mr. Van Lewin. 
having failed to answer the calendar call and to present themselves at this time, I'm going to mark it submitted. Dresden versus uh, Avail. Um, it's Aquafredi, Your Honor. Michael Dresden. That's the right. Account. I'm sorry. Right. I'm reading the wrong column. Thank you <laughs> so much. Aquafreda Enterprises versus Sterling. How about that? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank if, you. If, if I may, in, in the briefest summary possible of my brief, these are appellant's contentions. The court below found that respondents were not holders in due course, but it gave each respondent <clears throat> a personal statute of limitation. The court found that the plaintiff's complaint against Ava One failed because I failed to prove the allegations contained in the complaint. The court below found that CL45 had a privity of contract defense with respect to a complaint that didn't sound in contract, it sounded in UCC. Perhaps the most relevant comment the court below made regarding this case, it made <clears throat> in the motion to amend, when it said that respondents should be part of the case that they're now dismissed from, because they would be, <clears throat> sorry, substantially impacted by, by the verdict. Uh, so for the reasons aforesaid, for the reasons said in my brief, I respectfully ask the court that it reverse the decision of the court below. Thank you. Counsel, uh, with respect to CL45, um, Shouldn't they be dismissed because they weren't a party at all to the construction loan agreement? And that's no. what. No, no you were one of the. Okay, how do you how do you propose to keep them in? OK, the way that I propose to keep them in is exactly the way the court below did in the motion to amend the commonality. Totally different standard than a summary judgment motion. So that doesn't help you. The commonality you were on is that the, that they both came from they both acquired their interests from uh, uh, VCF. I'm sorry, Therefore, uh, I'm sorry, you weren't. I just was mumbling to myself. It's a 3211 motion, not a summary judgment motion, but the standard is still not the same as a motion to amend. But what I'm saying is this, the commonality is that, that CL45, the fact that it's a different note isn't the relevant issue. The relevant issue is that they both acquired from a non-holder in due course. So therefore they're non-holders in due course. But your whole theory is that under the um, construction loan agreement that there was a premature payment to the GC to let the GC go away and not stick around to do this certificate of occupancy. So how is CL45 at all implicated in that? No, Your Honor, the implication doesn't, the, the liability, if any, doesn't arise from what they did or what they failed to do. The liability arises by the fact that they might be adversely impacted by a decision rendered against Sterling Bank. Now, how would that be the case? Because as non-holder in due course assignees of the here and relevant notes, the liability of Sterling Bank and the non-holder in due course holder of the notes share the exact same liability. That's the finding that was made on the motion to amend. The motion to amend actually got the legal predicate for the relationship between the parties correct. Why the court below then chose to reverse it is I don't know why. All right, let's hear from the respondents. We'll hear from Vale One first. May it please the court. My name is Seth Weinberg and I represent defendant respondent Avail One LLC. Uh, your honors, this is a very narrow appeal, concerns a statute of limitations uh, and a breach of contract claim. Um, court should affirm the trial court's two underlying decisions. The first decision was the court's grant of Avail's motion to dismiss uh, on the basis of statute of limitations. Uh, the second decision was the court's denial of uh, appellant's motion to renew uh, on the basis of lack of new evidence. 
Concerning statute of limitations, your honors, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the standard in a contract case. Statute of limitations in a, con in a breach of contract case is six years from the date of accrual. Cruel, as the Court of Appeals has held, is the date of the alleged wrongful act. And if statute of limitations is shown to have expired prima facie, the burden shifts to the plaintiff to raise a tribal issue of fact concerning the statute of limitations, uh, concerning tolling, and whether the statute of limitations applies. Here, the alleged wrongful act was the payment of the $118,000. Right, and that happened on December 11, 2009, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. And you proved that up using documentary evidence that had previously been offered by the plaintiff, correct, on its motion to amend? That's correct, Your Honor. The, this action was not commenced until January 15th of 2016. Statute of limitations expired on December 11th of 2015, which was six years after the alleged wrongful act. The court below correctly determined that this action was barred by the statute of limitations because it had been commenced after the expiration of the statutory period. Now, in terms of um, the appellant's efforts to rebut this prima facie establishment of the expiration of the statute of limitation, there have been none. And the court below points that out uh, in its decision. Now, in terms of um, the additional portion of the, the of the decision, which relates to appellant's claim of damages for the respondent avails foreclosure on the property, the court below correctly determined that the appellant had failed to state a cause of action because the court below determined that there has been no liability that's been determined as to avails predecessor and in interest. Now, appellant argues that avail is avail lacks holder in due course status. This has not been determined definitively by the lower court. This was determined as an inference in favor of the non-moving party on a motion to dismiss. This is not a meritorious determination. Um, there is ample case law that comes out of this department that points to that issue. Um, and furthermore, again, there's been no determination as to liability. This court did previously determine in the foreclosure action, which came before this, which came before this court at judgment, that appellant failed to show that this contract claim, which appellant had attempted four times to raise as a defense in that foreclosure action, that appellant had failed to show that there were, I believe the language was harmful intent on the part of the foreclosing parties, which would lead to a cause of action. A veil request that this court uphold the lower court's decisions um, and yields the rest of its time. Thank you. All right, let's hear from respondent CL45, Ms. Bartley. Good afternoon, your honors, and may it please the court. Um, CL45 joins Avail 1 in its arguments relating to the statute of limitations, but uh, for brevity, I'm not going to address them uh, in my argument unless the court has specific questions. Um, it's CL45 position that both of the orders appealed from uh, were correctly decided by the lower court and the complaint was properly dismissed as against CL45. Um, as uh, Justice Moulton uh, drew out uh, in the appellant's uh, Oral argument, CL45 was assigned a wholly separate and distinct loan from uh, the construction loan that the appellant alleges uh, was breached by the lender. Uh, this loan 
uh, was not even originated and did not exist until after the alleged breach occurred. And there, so, therefore, there is no connection between the loan uh, that CL45 was assigned and uh, the uh, construction loan uh, issue uh, within this matter. There's no legal authority supporting the appellant's position <clears throat> that CL45 is exposed to general damages for the uh, its predecessor and in interest breach on a wholly separate and distinct loan. Um, UCC section 3-306, which uh, appellant refers to um, in his papers, is very specific to the instrument assigned. Uh, and the instrument assigned would, in CL45's case, be the CL45 note and mortgage, which again is a wholly separate and distinct loan from the construction loan that uh, was undisputably assigned to Avail One. Um, and it's for those reasons uh, that, uh, you know, the lower court correctly decided that um, not only was a cause of action barred by statute of limitations, but also the complaint. Uh, the causes of action in the complaint were barred by documentary evidence and failed to save it cause of action as against CL45. And unless there's any questions, um, we would rest on our brief and ask that the court affirm the lower court's orders. Any questions, colleagues? Mr. Dresden, you have rebuttal time. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, the, the, the document or purported document relied on to conclude a statute of limitations defense is unsigned, it's unauthenticated. It was submitted in the related foreclosure but never considered by the foreclosure judge of this court on the prior appeal, and it was not relied upon by Sterling Bank or Hudson Valley Bank to assert a statute of limitations defense defense. That document in terms of establishing a statute of limitations defense is wholly unreliable. But if the court Counselor, would you keep referring to document in the singular, weren't there documents, plural? Well, there were there was an unauthenticated unsigned note and to that unsigned note were attached purported bank statements. But, but you offered them in the in the foreclosure matters, right? They were presented, but not considered in the foreclosure well, matter. What, yes, presenting you're... something that's fraudulent in the foreclosure matter? No, of course not. <laughs> no, the court in the foreclosure case was was keen enough to be aware of the deficiency of the document that I presented to her and therefore didn't consider it at all. But if, if I may, Your Honor, continue. There is no claim that damages arise because of the related foreclosure. There's no dispute that, that the respondents have a right to foreclose if circumstances are such. Uh, the, the stay, the governor's stay is uh, undone and they have a right to foreclose. That's not even an issue. Okay, so basically what one of the main contentions is the purported document. The purported document would require um, Aquafreda to have sued the respondents prior to their acquiring a note, their, an interest in the note. How can the court sanction a statute of limitations that would expire before they acquired in the interest in a note that is the basis of the of the of of the, the lawsuit? Point number well, they, one. But but that's the nature of assignment, isn't it, Mr. Dresden? I'm sorry, Your Honor. That's the nature I, of assignment, though. You, you, it doesn't start anew just because you've assigned it. I mean, it, you know, you take it as it exists. Exactly. So that's there was no cause of action at the time because the statute of limitations had passed. The statute of limitations had passed, they, right? No, Your Honor, because the respondents can't have a statute of limitations that different, that's different than the statute of limitations their assigner had. Their assigner had a statute of lim uh, limitations that the commencement date is unknown. I'm saying the commencement date is being speculated upon on the basis of an unsigned document. The com the commencement date is unknown and Sterling banked into sort of statute of limitations defense. So how can respondents assert a statute of limitations defense if they stand in the shoes of their assigner? That, that's fundamental okay. case. I understand your argument. All right, anything else, counselors? I mean, colleagues, <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, counselors. Thank you all. Thank you, Your Honor.
Evet. O Flattery versus Colombo. Good afternoon, Lisa Go Coulson for um, appellant, third party defendant appellant um, Jackson Installation. Um, uh, I'm going to start with the grave injury argument, but I note I noted that the court um, earlier said that there was time for the cross appellant, and I will allow my adversary to speak to this issue, but. They did not perfect the cross appeal. Um, there was no respondents brief to a cross appeal. There was no reply. Um, so uh, I, I will wait for the court's questions on any argument for the cross appeal. But as of right now, I will not address it. Um, with respect to grave injury, because my client was O'Flaherty's employer, um, they could only be brought into a third party action for common law claims if there was a grave injury. Here, neither O'Flaherty nor any of the third party defendants. Can I interrupt because because you're the movement procedurally, you your client has to make a prima facie showing That's of right. lack of grave injury. And we can't consider the um, IME reports because they were submitted for the first time reply and therefore they can't be part of the prima facie. So putting aside the IME reports and putting aside uh, lack of proof in your opposing counsel position. How has your client made a prima facie showing of lack of grave injury? Um, your, your Honor, the issue is actually it's a pleading issue. It's that they never alleged that they. I know, but that's injury. that's shifting the burden because you're moving. You're the because you're the movement. You can't point to their lack of pleading. You have to make a prima facie showing under the relevant case law that there was not. A grave injury. So you can't just say they didn't plead it. You have to present some evidence because it's your motion that there was not a grave injury. That's that's where I, I don't see that. That's why I'm asking you the question. The parameters of a summary judgment motion uh, include that a party must address the claims that have been brought against them. And if the my adversary has not alleged a grave injury, then prima facie, I don't have to address that. that. That's that's a motion to dismiss standard. You're talking about pleadings, whether or not something's been pled or not pled, but that's not the appropriate standard. Once you get to a summary judgment motion, and that is what we are dealing with here, a summary judgment motion, not a motion to dismiss, it's no longer what's been pled or not pled. We look at the evidence, and for you to make out your prima facie, you have to actually have a prima facie showing with evidence of lack of grave injury in this case law that states that. So that's why I'm asking the question again, and I don't see that, so. Okay, I, I guess that um, my understanding has always been that from a pleadings perspective, when you're moving for summary judgment, you may move on a ground that is uh, um, encapsulated under 3211. And in this case, we were arguing that they failed to state a cause of action. They did not allege that there was a grave injury. The plaintiff- Wait, then Why did you make a 3211 motion? I'm sorry? Why didn't no, you make uh, a 3211 motion then? Yeah, what I'm saying is that under 3212, you can raise any issue that was that is under 3211. And in this case, there was no allegation that there was a grave injury. So can I, this, the, this is Judge Gish. I, 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 this is such a hyper technical argument that I, I have to admit I'm scratching my head a little bit. Had you made a 3211 motion and said, oh, my God, they didn't use the words grave injury. Guess what? The standard is not whether they what they have alleged, but whether they can can actually have a valid cause of action and they'd be able to put in papers to supplement the complaint. And here th there seems no question, but that at least for for if you're looking at from a pleading point of view, that there's no problem here. So now let's look at it from, as my colleague indicated, a summary judgment point of view. Did you, from a summary judgment point of view, sustain your prima facie burden of proving no grave injury? And again, I would go back to, if you look at the bill of particulars, when those types of injuries were not alleged, 
Um, and these are statutorily defined injuries. So you're acknowledging that they are in the Bill of Particulars, though. No, what I'm saying is that they that grave injuries are not alleged in the Bill not of Particulars. Not the words aren't used. No, no, I'm saying that, that uh, grave what injuries... What are you saying? Go ahead. Grave injuries are defined statutorily. Correct. And the you're plaintiff... Aware. Right, and so certainly the plaintiff or the third-party plaintiff can list these are the grave injuries, you know, loss of multiple fingers, loss of a thumb, whatever it might be. But in the bill of particulars, that too is not there. So again, you know, even if we're not talking about the complaint itself in 3211, if you look at the bill of particulars, there's no allegation that the plaintiff sustained a grave injury in this case. I would also note, which I did in my brief, that a uh, plaintiff put in uh, an affirmation in, in opposition, but it was really just to state their position. No one has moved for summary judgment against us. They did not use that as an opportunity to clarify, to say, oh, yes, we are actually alleging a grave injury. We are seeking damages under 1B. There is a grave injury here. Uh, sorry, we didn't plead it properly. So I think that the plaintiff's um, own statement in opposition or, or statement on the motion actually buttresses our position that there was no grave injury. And I would ask that the court rely on the second department's decision in Cassis versus SBJ um, Duraliman, which okay. uh, addresses this issue. Thank you. All right, let's hear from your adversary. Yeah, you're oh, on mute. Afternoon. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honors. My name is Justin Domenich. I'm at the law firm of Gartner and Bloom, and we're counsel for TJM, which is the respondent here. Um, as uh, my colleague alluded to, there's only one appeal before the court. Um, it's my colleague's appeal, so we're just the respondents here. Um, I know we've been afforded um, two sets of time, but as respondent, I expect that we would not have, we would not actually be afforded that if everything had been clearly. Uh, Sort of delineated. Right, I'm taking my two minutes back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for the acknowledgement, though. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so I think uh, the court's questions um, before I got my swing here more or less did a lot of the work for me. Um, this is a question of a motion that had a bit of an identity crisis. Uh, they moved according to a 32, basically according to a 3211 philosophy. Um, then on reply, they decided to switch it to a summary judgment philosophy. And unfortunately, because of that, well, unfortunately for them, um, they didn't hit either one. Um, this is a case where you know that this is a grave injury case because on the first page of plaintiff's, uh, plaintiff's complaint, <laughs> he states the fact that he suffered multiple intentional injuries to the head. Um, and this then have as, been a lot easier, though, if you put the words grave injury into the complaint? I mean, would we be uh, here? Yes. yes and no, Your Honor. Um, there's a, sort of a double-edged sword. Um, I know Oftentimes it's discouraged for parties as part of their pleadings to directly reproduce statutory language because it tends to become sort of a few hundred pages. No, involved, fair, but... fair enough. I didn't I wouldn't have said in the absence of pleading facts as well, but. <laughs> but, but here, yes, um, it would have been more convenient to simply use the the magic word, so to speak. But if we're going to sort of use that, use the phrase magic word, the problem we have is the statute doesn't call for magic words. The statute doesn't actually specify pleading requirements. Um, we have a whole separate set of law and rules for that. Um, we also have the, the things that I think are most important here um, beyond section 11, which is the court's decisions. Um, I, put, I found myself in the strange position here of defending, <laughs> in some cases, the line of decisions coming from this court and uh, which some members of this panel have been a part of, uh, particularly the Positions that were taken by the trial court relied upon Alalema and upon Rubais. We also bring up a more recent example of Padilla in our brief. Uh, grave injury has been interpreted and reinterpreted and interpreted all over again. Um, it has not done anything to change the fact that the Section 11 is designed to protect an employer. But while protecting an employer, it does leave the caveat of grave injury, and that grave injury directly correlates to an inability to be able to work again because of those injuries. Um, it has been found that post-traumatic stress disorder qualifies. It has been found that other types of cognitive or cranial impacts can qualify. All of those things basically would be a common reading of plaintiff's complaint, which was incorporated into our name pleader. It would also be an obvious reading from the post-traumatic stress disorder that he brought up in his bill of particulars, which is one of the things that Jackson moved upon. 
So when you get to the question of grave injury, I don't think there really is much of a question at all, because what's happening here is the appeal doesn't so much challenge that the trial court got it wrong. The appeal so much challenges an entire line that goes from the court of appeals to this court down to the trial court, which are all quite consistent as to what a grave injury consists of and what is required to both plead it as well as ultimately to determine it. Here, that was never going to happen. Um, you have a situation where the evidence is only on reply, so you have a defect right there. And that evidence, obviously, if it's on reply, it can't be competent evidence. And that also assumes that this evidence was going to be somehow sufficient on the basis of its own terms. And it couldn't be because you have medical report fragments. And we're talking about from a separate administrative proceeding, not from this proceeding itself. And there are years out of date. Um, so again, we run into an identity disorder here where it seems as if the Jackson tried to do two separate types of motions and didn't actually meet their burden for either one. Um, and in turn, they seem to have argued that it would have gone to the third party plaintiffs to actually meet that burden and establish for plaintiff that he had suffered a um, grave injury. And this is alluded to by my colleague when she mentions that they had a chance to weigh in on their on the opposition and they chose not to use that opportunity. They don't have to use that opportunity. Um, they are they do not have a claim against their employer and they could not have a claim against their employer in this instance. So they, were, they didn't have to put in any papers at all. So the papers they put in procedurally were never intended on on moving the scales one way or another. The tactical decisions that plaintiff's counsel does or doesn't make, though, has nothing to do with whether or not my client still has common law claims against Jackson. As alluded to in the briefs, the only reason my client's in this is because of Jackson. So either we're in this because uh, we're still figuring this out from a summary judgment perspective, because there are no depositions, there's no IMEs. We, we didn't even have the, I didn't personally have a bill of particulars or the accident footage, or this has already been decided before we need discovery at all. But if that was the case, we wouldn't really have needed to have a summary judgment analysis to begin with. Uh, there, I think I've used my time up. So if there aren't you, any yeah, questions. Yeah, you just ran out of time. Yeah. All right, it, thank you. All right, we'll hear, we'll hear the only rebuttal on this. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to make one point um, as to the uh, medical evidence or the reports that were submitted in the reply. Um, I pointed out in my brief, in my reply brief, that uh, in the memo of law, which is not part of this record, it was indicated that the sole reason that that medical report was um, put in in the reply was not to address the prima facie showing, but rather because counsel argued that the motion was premature. And we were just stating our position that basically when you argue that a motion is premature, it is because uh, as to the moving party, they, the evidence is within their exclusive possession and control. And what we were essentially saying is that this is a document that had been turned over by the plaintiff um, to all of the parties. We have no exclusive information as to O'Flaherty's medical condition or his claims. So that was the sole purpose of submitting that. It was not to make out the prima facie evidentiary burden that we were required to make under 32B12. We believe that we did that by pointing out the defects in the pleadings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. People versus Molina. Lena Genoda, Noreen Stackhouse. Since nobody has responded and nobody checked in, I'm going to mark this matter submitted. Campisi versus Shea. Yes, Your Honor. You can proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Justices, may it please the court. I'm going to be as brief as I can because I see that you've all done your homework as I've seen in past years in, in my long practice. Uh, essentially, this case is, is about an arbitrary and capricious decision in the court below. This is a gentleman, Joseph Campisi, who had applied in 2013 for a uh, special carry license one that validated essentially his 2001 issued full carry license from upstate New York. At the time, he had a business of 
over 25 years with his father and his brother. An electrical. Also, let me interrupt you. Yes, uh, you mentioned the 2013 application. Does this renewal application that's at issue here, um, did Mr. Campisi say that he had to respond to calls at night as opposed to someone else at the company? He did. Nothing has changed in the way he does business, only that his company has grown. He's, so there's some specific statement, and if you have a record site, that's useful, where he says, I'm still doing this. I'm still going out at night myself personally. I don't want to take up all your time, so it's okay. If you don't have it at hand, yeah, I mean, right. his, his letter of necessity is fairly clear, and his supplemental letter of necessity actually elaborates on what he did. He gave a sampling of locations. Uh, that he does go to. He does actually go to these locations. He doesn't always go to the locations. He's got 25 to 30 employees. He's got now 10 trucks, uh, very high-end trucks. They each hold between 40 and $60,000 worth of equipment, including copper that's used in his plumbing business. Uh, I can personally attest in the many years I spent working in the Bronx on the Grand Concourse, that at least once every couple of months, you'd see plumbing missing from inside the courthouse. It does happen. It's easily convertible to cash, as are his uh, the tools in his trucks. He was carefully vetted, and he was approved by the city on uh, September 23rd, 2013, as was his brother. He reapplied for renewal in 2016. Nothing changed at that time. Uh, nothing changed in the law. The only thing that did change was the administration within the NYPD. There was a shakeup. I'm sure many of you probably are familiar with that. The CEO was replaced. The director of pistol licensing was replaced. I can only think that this must be the reason why everything was looked into. And looking at the um, Pistol Licensing Division's investigative report, they specifically asked for the investigator to go back and look at his prior application, why they would do that. That was in 2019, I, I apologize. Why they would do that, I, I don't know. He was denied as was uh, Mr. Raymond Mucci in 2017, who commenced an appeal. After the appeal, he was approved. Mr. Mucci was one of two persons, his wife was his partner, in a small plumbing business in Queens. Essentially the same facts, not a lot of cash, yet he was approved. In 2019, and the names are omitted to protect the uh, clients who felt that they didn't want any retaliation from NYPD on their renewal, plus they wanted to remain anonymous. As you can imagine, people don't really like other people knowing that they have a concealed handgun license and they may be carrying a handgun. Uh, counsel, that just going sense. back to counsel, this is Justice Kennedy. Just going back to the two John Doe licenses from 2009 and 2010. Yeah. Uh, did the petitioner provide any documentation to indicate what the uh, determinations were based upon? Why were the licenses granted? Well, those were actually 2019 cases, uh, both of them, and they they did not show show why they were granted. But except the, the facts are with the two John Doe cases, they each were landlords. They each said they collected rent, but yet after investigation found that they didn't turn in a whole lot of cash, so they weren't really collecting cash. But they had buildings in, in unsafe areas that they felt were unsafe. They felt that they were in danger. And after denial, each of them on, on appeal were approved. Counsel, I'd like to go back to something that Justice Moulton had questioned you on, because I was under the impression that in 2013, the petitioner stated that he personally responded to various jobs. 
But in the renewal application in 2019, he indicated it was his company and not him personally. He says on uh, page 250 of the record, the second paragraph, there are indeed times that these after hours and emergency calls take me into bad areas, high crime areas, and may require that I go into basements, sub-basements, and dark alleys where I could easily be targeted and attacked. That was something that somehow got twisted and convoluted um, by the city attorneys and by the court below. I don't know why his position has never changed. He runs the company. He, he runs a company that makes between seven and $10 million a year. Um, he does go to these areas personally. So the, the point that I try to make with um, the additional references between Mucci and the two John Doe cases is that what we have The situations where the decisions by the court below are not consistent. In the matter of um, Robert H. Mr. Mendoza, you, you have exceeded your time, so I'm going to ask you to make your point, but to make it succinctly. I'm just going to reference two cases. The Scarlato, which was an Article 78 decision, uh, granted by Justice Gerald Held. And what he writes in here is what's important. While the court applauds the respondent in its efforts to review all applications, the respondent has in the past been charged with this responsibility. Petitioner's most recent application repeats these reasons that have been set forth in all the previous applications. The respondent's denial of the permit when the petitioner had for many years been granted a permit for the same reasons was arbitrary and capricious. In the matter of Goldstein versus Brown, this court. Yeah, I, I don't think you have to read, and I'm, you don't have to read it to us. As long as we have the cases, if you want to, I'll let you read it on rebuttal. Okay. Uh, I, I was just going to understand your point. Two right. short quotes. That was it. Understand. May I do that? You are so far exceeded your time. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the court which was then staffed by uh, Justice Sullivan, who swore me in, Justice Malonis, Wallach, Ross, and Ash. Um, I, I knew them all. The court went on to say, explanation by the agency, an administrative agency decision, which on essentially the same facts as underlaid a prior agency determination, which is a conclusion contrary to the prior determination, is arbitrary and capricious. They go on to say, respondent failed to provide any explanation regarding why it distinguished the petitioner from other applicants to whom carry permits were granted upon less specific proof of threat. Thank and you. I, I'll stop there. Okay, thank right. you. All right, we're gonna hear from your adversary. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Tahir Sadria appearing on behalf of the police commissioner. Uh, this court should confirm the denial of petitioner's application to renew his special carry license. Um, the license division rationally found that, plaintiff, that petitioner had failed to demonstrate proper cause. This court has repeatedly held that working in an unsafe neighborhood and generalized assertions that somebody is carrying ex expensive equipment do not suffice to establish proper cause. And the fact that this is a renewal application does not alter petitioner's obligation to demonstrate proper cause on his application. There's an independent, an independent showing and an independent investigation are required on renewal as on an initial application. Um, and, uh, and here he has not shown that he has, that, that the, a different determination was reached on essentially the same facts. In his initial application, there was a, a conversation in which he said he goes out on every um, on every job and he is, you know, which takes him to various parts of the city late at night. And he provided documentation of invoices of like the jobs that he had he had gone to, which enabled the police um, investigator to make a call to to some of his clients who confirmed, yes, he comes out 
we, we are calling him out to one of our buildings all, all the time late at night. And that kind of documentation was not presented here. And but it's- Well, it, even if it was, if, you, if the decision is based on the idea that going to a bad neighborhood in and of itself is not a proper cause, then it wouldn't make a difference, would it? Well, I think that, I mean, there's two issues. I mean, one is that certainly, even if the the division the license licensed division decided in 2013 that going out to bad neighborhoods late at late at night provided proper cause under the statute then certainly yes the license division is entitled to to determine now in 2019 that that actually this was an incorrect interpretation of the of the statute and what is required to demonstrate proper cause and can and can you know, go in a, in a different direction as long as that determination is reasonable and it is applied, that change in policy is applied consistently. And certainly the the policy as it was enunciated in the, in the decision is reasonable and it's consistent with the precedent as established in this court of what constitutes proper cause. And, um, and there's no showing that it has been inconsistently applied. His uh, in in the his administrative appeal, he cited to two John Doe situations, which without any kind of evidence of what what were the facts behind those um, um, those license determinations and uh, any basis for the for the city to be able to or for the uh, license division to be able to say no, this is actually a different demonstrate why these were actually different. Just, determinations or why different determinations were reached. Um, and he didn't argue even in his administrative appeal that his that the determination here in 2019 was was inconsistent um, such that it would have prompted so as to prompt the um, the license division to explain why it was that it was reaching a different decision here. But before you even get to that point of trying to say it's like well this where the why a decision was reached, a different decision was reached on essentially the same facts, you have to first show that there were essentially the same facts. And here, petitioner hasn't demonstrated that the uh, the record that was before the um, the police the police commissioner in in 2019 was essentially the same as the record that was before the commissioner in 2013. And so you never get beyond that. You don't. You don't need to get beyond that um, to determine in determining whether or not there was like whether it was they arbitrarily went in a different direction or reached a different conclusion. Um, if the court has no, so as I said, I mean this is otherwise it's this the determination here is very clearly consistent with um, the precedent as established in this court and is rational on that basis. And petitioner hasn't argued that it is not. Um, accordingly, if there's no further questions, the city would rest on its brief. I have one further question, which is between 2013 and 2019, did anything change in the law as to what proper cause is? There was not, as far as I know, there was not a change in the law as to what proper cause was, and certainly there are um, there are numerous cases that predate 2016 that say that um, a simply simply um, operating a business in an area that's considered an unsafe area, or um, carrying uh, vague allegations of carrying large amounts of or expensive equipment is insufficient to establish proper cause. Uh, proper cause to um, um, for a carry license. So I'm 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 not certain what the what the basis was here, but there was certainly in the 2013 there was a there was a showing that he himself was going out into various areas at, at, at night. And so it appears that that was the basis of, of the prior determination. Um, we don't have a final determination setting forth the reasons why the initial, the initial license was granted. 
Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Randazzo, you have two minutes. Thank you, I'm gonna be quick. Um, as in Mucci, uh, record on appeal 187, the two John Does, uh, 192 to 195 and 197 to 200, they each give the facts of, of the underlying case, what, what the people did who applied, uh, what their, their proper cause was, and the decisions were made upon that. It is totally not true that the, the city had no uh, way to investigate. And so far as the 2013 application goes, and, and Mr. Campisi never said that he was the only one who went to all these jobs. What he did state, the applicant states, and this is in the investigative report by the PLD, the applicant states that his duties and responsibility require him to go on call, to be on call 24 hours, seven days a week. He has to constantly travel throughout the five boroughs of New York and the counties to conduct business. Since he may have to respond in the middle of the night, he finds himself at risk of danger and vulnerability greater than that of other business enterprises in New York City. Uh, the New York Police Department does not have boundless discretion. They cannot say, okay, you three people all have the same jobs, all have the same reason to get a gun, and yet, number one, number two, we're going to grant you a permit. The number three, we're not. Then two times, three times, maybe four times later, their licenses are renewed. But then one time, all of a sudden, the license is not renewed. That is, is the problem that we have. It's an inconsistency. The, the, the laws of the, of the land are founded on consistency. Stare decisis. That is why courts follow their predecessors and in interests. That's why the Supreme Court of the United States is wrestling with certain cases that are now being taken up again. There must be a, 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 a we have to follow laws. And okay. Administrative agencies are no different. There are laws there that must be followed. The, the section 400 of the penal law, which is a state law, only mentions the word proper cause. It gives no definition. It is vague and ambiguous. Ambiguous, I apologize. We, we understood what you meant. <laughs> right. And Thank that you. would be decided within the next few months by the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, yet the city comes in and now they make their own law on proper cause and they redefine it. Put Mr. Randazzo, you need to wrap it up. You've exceeded your time. <laughs> Thank you, thank, you. Thank, thank you all for your time. Thank, thank you all. Thank you both, counselors. Thank you. Okay, Sanchez against the Department of Education. Um, yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stuart Carlin. I'm representing Mr. Sanchez in this appeal from an Article 78 proceeding arising from uh, New York County Supreme. I would be remiss just to let the court know that apparently during the pendency of this appeal, he he got tenured. He, he did eventually get tenured. Yeah. No, uh, but, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you raised that because I was going to ask you. So is there a, any benefit now in terms of having a, a, of, of seeking tenure at an earlier time? What else uh, what else is available? Well, I think that there could be some benefits because his tenure only goes to 2021 versus his original tenure date, which was in 2002. And there could be benefits that accrue to him uh, through the collective bargaining agreement, seniority rights, and things of that nature. So what are those benefits, Mr. Carlin? Well, uh, things like building seniority. I mean, I'm not an expert on the contract, to be quite, uh, 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 to be quite frank. But I, I, I don't, I think that his tenure date uh, could it, you know potentially have some ramifications? So I don't think that the case is is moot. Um, it, it's it's not. I don't Did think it, it's moot. His tenure date should be 2002, not 2021. Um, uh, and and, and uh, so I don't think it's moot. So, do you, but your 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 client, knowing that he got tenure, still wanted to pursue this. Well, the appeal was already pending. He got tenure, and I believe in the fall. Um, uh, okay. You know, I I don't think it's entirely moot only because this tenure day may could potentially maybe impact 
uh, some of his rights, uh, particularly uh, if schools are closed and things like that. So I, 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 don't, I don't think it's entirely moot. Um, and if I could just ad address the couple of the issues, I don't want to take the court, too much yeah. of the court's time. I, I mean, it's clear to me that um, once um, he put his application in to rescind his resignation, and that, res and that was approved by the DOE, that by operation of law, his tenure should have been re restored to the original date of 2002. Uh, it's it's by operation of law cited by uh, cited in in, in in the brief and in a number of cases, but more importantly in Chancellor's Regulation C 20529, it's very clear that once they approve uh, the, the rescission, his his tenure does get restored. So I I, I would respectfully submit that um, that but, the I mean does. You would concede that um, being rehired is different than getting your tenure back, correct? They don't necessarily follow. That is correct, but he put an application in your honor to rescind his resignation. He had to go through a security clearance and uh, uh, because his name was coded because of the confusion regarding his resignation, which I won't, uh, which unless the court has questions on, I won't really go, go into uh, any details on that. I think though, once they approve his, the rescinding of his resignation by operation of law, the, the, the resignation is gone. I mean, the parties are restored to their original position and that's basically codified in uh, C-205-29. Uh, yeah, 29 talks about tenured staff, but it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think, unless you point to some language, refer to anything about what happens to the prior tenure accrued? Well, it says here, uh, um, Your Honor, non-supervisory pedagogical employee who has attained permanent tenure prior to the date of resignation, so I remain tenured and upon written request be permitted to withdraw such resignation subject only to medical examination and approval of the chancellor. So I think it's clear, um, besides the case law, which supports the restoration of putting the parties back to where they were before the rescission, uh, the chances regulation uh, is, um, does the same thing. I see. So the words remain tenured are the ones you're relying on, it sounds like. Right. Yes. So. Um, and, but how do you address uh, the DOE's arguments that it's rule, it's item 31 of C205 that really controls here, that you have to give the 30 days. Um, well, he, you know, no, this, uh, no good deed goes unpunished here, uh, basically, because he obviously was in, in, inquiring as to how, what to do. He could have stayed on leave without pay. He wanted to help his principal out. His principal said to go ahead and, and, and resign. Uh, and that's what he did. So he was relying on the advice of the um, uh, of his principal and, and, and the human resources. But even if you take that argument at face value, uh, uh, Your Honor, um, the rescission, the approval of the rescission restores. The, they could have conditionally reinstated him. I mean, they, they could have said, OK, we'll reinstate you, but, only, but we're not going to restore your tenure. They could have done it on uh, conditionally, but they didn't. They, they accepted his resignation, uh, rather they accepted the um, rescission of the resignation and reinstated him. So the parties are in fact restored. It's like the resignation never existed. And, uh, um, and so I would respectfully submit that um, his original tenure date um, should be, um, should be uh, 2002, not, not 2021. Thank you. All right, we'll hear from your adversary. Good afternoon. May it please the court, Lorenzo De Silvio, on behalf of the Department of Education. This court should affirm and can uh, do and so. Mr. On Wait, before we yes, get to the law, Mr. De Silvio, do you know if there is an appreciable difference between getting an earlier tenure than a later tenure? 
Your Honor, I am not aware of any appreciable difference. Having consulted with my client, the department, uh, I was advised that there's no change in salary, no change in terms of retirement or seniority. I'm not aware of any other uh, material differences or differences at all. Okay. Now go ahead. So, Your Honor, I was going to say, oh, yes, Your Honor. You can, I was just, you can proceed with your argument. Yes, Your Honor. I was going to say that this court should affirm and can do so on exhaustion grounds on the merits or both. Because uh, my adversary focused on the merits, I'd like to jump right in there. Uh, following on Justice Moulton's question, the mutual rescission argument that my adversary makes, it, it really does conflate reinstatement with a separate and distinct concept of restoration and of tenure. What's more, it was implicitly rejected by the Court of Appeals in Springer. Because there, the uh, mutual rescission happened, just like here, allegedly. But yet, the teacher was not allowed to be tenured again. It had to serve a new probationary period because they had not applied for reinstatement before the start of the school year. So that argument is just a non-starter. Certainly, I understand the focus on item 29. But Sprinkler didn't deal with this question about whether he had to give 30 days notice, correct? That's it wasn't correct. That it was it, it was a different requirement that that he did not meet. But here, the very fact that the requirements for reinstatement live in two different provisions, 28 and 29, underscore that to understand Chancellor's Regulation C205, you have to read the regulation as a whole. But here, I haven't heard Sanchez explain what it means to be reinstated, but without tenure being restored. Council, that was going to be my question for you. Where exactly in the regulation does it state, in, and ambiguously, that without the 30-day notice, you don't get tenure? So we're relying on 26A, and 31 is its mirror provision. 31 deals with retirement. Uh, 26A deals with So what's the language in 26A that you're relying on? It is that a failure to submit timely notice shall preclude subsequent restoration of the license. And that matters because when you start working at the department, the department gives you a license, and it's the grant of that license by the department that starts the clock running and determines whether you're tenured or probationary. So that's why we hang our hat on that. To be sure, this is not some unambiguous, pollucidly clear regulation, but that actually underscores why deference is to Silvio, then that was yes, what you just said was important. So in other words, the, the restoration of the license, that's the key. Is that what you're saying in 26A? Yes. And that's what we're relying on. Fair to and give so the, the restoration of the license means that what you're tenured or you are on track to get tenured or what does it mean? Restoration of the license, meaning that you enjoy the tenure status you had before you resigned, uh, provided that you were tenured beforehand and you but satisfy all the conditions of the regulation. But don't all teachers, whether tenured or probationary, require licenses? Yes, they do. That's the state license. So this is the departmental license that determines that starts the clock running on tenure. It would be nice to know that. I mean, this is almost opaque. So is there a, a, a case or, or some other provision of uh, 205 that unpacks what you just said? About no, I mean, our, our, our argument is that deference is owed because this is the way that the department has consistently applied this rule. Certainly, uh, Sanchez has not claimed or pointed out any other instance where they haven't applied this rule in this way to this fact pattern. You know, perhaps that's why his union wouldn't proceed to steps two and three of the required three step process under his contract, precisely because this is the way DOE always does it. And certainly the fact that Springer speaks of the importance of strict compliance by the teacher, it really underscores that the regulations that are available online, certainly to the extent he's concerned about what he wants to do to protect his rights. If he wants to come back, he can ask the, the department or he could ask his union representative. So they were certainly involved in this case. And I'd just like to briefly uh, point I, I out that wanna, you, yes, before Your you go to that, I have one question on one of the on the provision that you relied on the the thirty one. It did it did have like an exception and out like in other words that he could get written authorization from the executive director of human resources to waive that thirty day rec uh, resignation problem in advance. Yes, is, is that is am I reading that correctly? So we interpret that to mean you can't get your tenure back automatically, but at the discretion of the department, we could choose to give it back. And in this case, they did not. And I'm not aware of any instance when they were have. They, were, were they asked to? I do not believe that they were asked to. The record does not reflect that. 
I was just going to make one final point, which is just that the estoppel argument doesn't have uh, merit because the record reflects that Sanchez made the decision to resign all on his own before the principal even got involved. And there's nothing in the email correspondence that uh, suggests that the principal was inveying Sanchez to do something without uh, understanding his rights before doing mm -hmm. so. This court should affirm. OK, let's hear a rebuttal. Mr. Corlin, please. Okay. Uh, um... In reference to the, the reliance on uh, 25-6A, it, it references is restoration of, line, uh, of, of the license or issuance of the substitute license. Um, the, 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 DOE, uh, the DOE doesn't issue um, a teacher a license. That, that, that's done by the New York State Department of Education. They're referencing here a substitute license, which is what the DOE issues. And it doesn't mention anything about tenure at all. And I think it was correctly pointed out that um, that the, the, the failure to provide the 30 days notice only deals with the licenses that the, the DOE issues, which pertains only to substitute licenses, uh, period. It does not apply. They could have easily inserted language about uh, tenure if you don't give the proper notice, uh, period. Um, as far as the estoppel argument goes, uh, the, you can see the email train, and I'm not going to I'll go into any further detail on that. Obviously, he was on leave without pay at the time. Uh, he asked for advice on what to do, and he, and he, and he, uh, he took uh, the principal and HR's advice. He, he, they were, there is the emails that are attached, um, and uh, I rest on the brief. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you both. Thank you. The next case is certain underwriters at Lloyd's versus NL. Yes, Your Honor. Um, good afternoon, Justices. This is Carl Kravitz. Before I start my time, the um, clerk suggested that I renew our request um, for me to split my argument time with Mr. John Hacker, who is on the line. Um, we we filed that request, and Mr. You, you did. And I granted it. Oh, okay. um, I, I, you know, if you want, I could strictly do two and a half minutes for each of you, or you can keep the time yourself. But you get five minutes between you, however you want it. We understand, Your Honor. Um, right. So how, how do you want to count for the time? Um, well, I, I'm going to get started, and I'll see how your questions are. But I definitely am going to reserve. Um, it, some time in the five minutes. From I don't know what that means. So I'll watch your time. I'll give you two and a half minutes. Well, I mean, okay. I don't, you yeah. know, I, I don't know if you'll be able to ask us questions about that. No you more, if we need that. to ask you questions, we, we make, we, we allow for that. You know, we understand this is a complicated case. Okay. Are, yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Go uh, ahead. Um, good afternoon. Carl Kravitz for the insurers. I'm going to address the um, expected or intended issue. The trial court flatly misread the Santa Clara decision stating at record 6364 that there was no evidence in the Santa Clara action that NL intended harm to children. So the liability could be covered under New York law. The Santa Clara decisions in fact found with no ambiguity that NL knew that lead patent homes would poison and harm children yet it intentionally and affirmatively promoted lead paint for that use. Santa Clara II, the appeal after trial, was specific that NL knew with certainty that, quote, lead paint used on the interiors of homes would deteriorate, close quote, resulting, quote, lead dust would poison children and cause serious injury, close quote. Quote, high level exposure to lead was fatal, close quote, and quote, lower level exposure harmed children. These factual findings were affirmed by the California Court of Appeal in Santa Clara II under the heading actual knowledge, and they are the binding record to determine coverage in this action. The findings um, conclusively establish that NL's liability is not insurable under long settled New York law, which holds that a harm is expected or intended when the insured either desired the harm or is substantially certain it will occur. The premise of NL's argument, at least in its brief, that which is that New York law does not apply the substantial certainty prong, 
it is just wrong. To the extent that the trial court's analysis was based on that misunderstanding, it committed reversible error. The findings that NL knew was certainty that the harm would result, not its liability would result, easily surpassed the substantial certainty hurdle and compelled judgment for the insurers on all policies. Under New York's fortuity doctrine, um, liability policies can cover only unexpected and unintended losses, whether or not there is expected or intended language in the policies. Um, but instead of applying the knowledge findings to the substantial certainty test, the trial court analogized NL's liability to product liability. That is another flat misreading of the Santa Clara decisions, which held well, unambiguous- I'll just indicate to you, Mr. Kravitz, your two and a half minutes are up. Okay, well, I'm just about, I'm like within 10 seconds- okay, of I, You could split up the time as you like. I'm not- okay. well, let you know. me let me just, I'm just going to finish this sentence and I'm turn it over to Mr. Hacker. Um, I, where was I? I said, uh, yes, analogizing it to product liability was a flat mystery of the Santa Clara decisions, which held unambiguously that the uh, California nuisance climate issue is not like product liability because it requires actual knowledge that the harm would occur. That, def that difference is determinative for coverage. Okay, I am now going to turn it over to Mr. Hacker. And I'm going to address the other, thank you, Your Honors. Uh, and I'm going to address the other two issues, starting with the, what we refer to as the as damages issues, uh, which focuses on the language of the policy covering, quote, sums the insured becomes legally obligated to pay as damages. Under New York law and under the English language, the phrase as damages must have some independent meaning. And NL's own argument proves the point. At page 55 of its brief, NL asserts their argument, quote, the term damages means money, simple as that. But that makes the policy incoherent. Under NL's view, the policy would cover, quote, sums the insured must pay as money. As that impossible construction shows, damages in fact does not just mean money under New York law, it means money that compensates for loss. And the abatement award here does not compensate anyone for anything, as the Santa Clara 2 decision explicitly holds in rejecting NL's argument that the award is merely a thinly disguised damages award. That ruling is controlling here. Now let me turn to the because of argument. The Supreme Court here held that an award is because of bodily injury or property damage, even though the plaintiff claims only economic costs as here, because the court held that the costs bear a causal connection, however remote, to a bodily injury and property damage suffered by third parties. To see the error in that holding, I'll simply commend you to the uh, Delaware Supreme Court's recent Rite Aid decision, which is an excellent application of the controlling rule here as stated by the New York Court of Appeals in the Lavinon case. That, uh, that statement is, quote, an insurer's obligation to compensate for bodily injury does not extend to directly claim the loss of services which occurred okay, so, at- I'm sorry, Mr. Hacker, just say that again. I, I had trouble hearing you. In the Lavinant case, the court held yes. insure, the insurer's obligation to compensate for bodily injury does not extend to derivative claims for loss of services, that's what was at issue in that particular case, which occurred as a result of physical injury suffered by a third person, categorically rejecting, in other words, the causal connection theory that NL uh, advances in this case. The same rule applies to property damage as the second department held in the structural case and the Supreme Court held in the Monroe case. There's thus no coverage here, your honors, because the counties themselves suffered neither bodily injury nor property damage, and they did not and legally could not, your honors, assert claims on behalf of anybody who did suffer bodily injury or property damage. The only exception to that principle enunciated in Lavinant um, is the uh, exception recognized in the Rite Aid case, and that was based on a specific policy provision in that case, allowing coverage where the plaintiff is being re reimbursed for its direct costs of providing medical care for bodily injury. That provision doesn't exist in the policies here, and the principle doesn't apply in any event because, as I just explained, in this case, the counties did not and legally could not claim reimbursement for anything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Succinct. Okay. Respondent. Is there a respondent? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Joel Hurz on behalf of NL Industries. 
Uh, let me jump right in and take the first argument first, which is their accident event fortuity argument. And first and foremost, the vast bulk of the policies that are issued here have none of that language. They don't have an accident requirement. They simply say that there needs to be an event. An event is described as something, nothing more than a cause. So that the entire argument that they're making is not even predicated on the language that's in the vast bulk of the policies. There are 340 different insurance policies, each with different riders. And so for that reason, first and foremost, it doesn't apply. Let's assume for sake of argument that it did apply. What did the California Appeals Court say? And this is at page 533 and 534 of the opinion, is that all that the people needed to prove was that there was substantial evidence that NL knew that interior lead paint posed a quote, and this is the important part right here, a significant risk of harm to children. That's what the court said. If you look at all of this court's jurisprudence on the issue of intended and expected, and the Court of Appeals decision, where people have taken shotguns and shot people, the significant risk of harm of a product, airplanes, cars, Drano, all those kinds of things, does not preclude the purchase of insurance. Judge Maisley got it right. She studied the record carefully. She studied the various three opinions that were underneath. Nowhere in any of those opinions did anybody ever say that NL intended to, spec to, to intend harm. None of any of those opinions was harm ever said to have been expected. There was no plan, nor under these facts could there ever be one, which is NL advertised pain stopped it in 1950. A nuisance was found 50 plus years later. There's nothing to the accident expected. Let me turn, unless there's questions on that, let me turn to the second argument, which is the as damages. Yet again, Judge Maisley studied the record. The policies made very clear that they just didn't cover damages, they covered loss, loss, expense, and they have this very broad language of any kind and for whatever reason whatsoever. The argument that they made to Judge Maisley was that the court below was, that the, the California court was making an equitable decision and our policies don't cover equity. First and foremost, none of the policies ever say that. There is no equity exclusion. There's no abatement exclusion. There's no exclusion of that kind in any way, shape, or form, okay? More so, even if there was here, what we have not paid for is, there was no injunction. We have paid money damages. Money is damages as defined under these, as interpreted as the person who bought these policies from the 1940s through the person, through the present, and money damages should be covered here and they should be. The third piece is this because of, and the because of issue comes back to this, which is there's only one reason we're all here today, which is lead paint years after it was put on flaked because landlords didn't properly maintain the paint and some children had higher levels of blood. Number one, that's property damage. It's under all the New York cases, incorporation of a product that later becomes dangerous. It's all the asbestos cases that this court has decided. So there's property damage. Secondly, there's only a nuisance because some kids had high blood levels or higher blood levels. That's either bodily injury or personal injury. We are here because of property damage and bodily injury. We've got both here. And so there's nothing to that argument in any way, shape, or form. That's really the substance. I think the rest of it is largely left out in the brief. There is, to me, in my mind, one more interesting question here is, what's the standard of review here? This was the denial of a motion for summary judgment with no discovery of any kind taken. They cited the case Rothhouse, which from the 1960s that say that de novo review can be appropriate for a ruling on a denial for motion for summary judgment. We cited two later cases of this court, which were the dependable list case, 1983, and the Alfaro case, 2010, that said, no, it's an abuse of discretion when you're gonna go back and look at a record when a judge has taken facts and applied them to law. We went ahead and cited a bunch of federal cases that in these circumstances say that it's abuse of discretion. In their reply brief, they never cited anything to the different, and they didn't cite any cases that disputed the two subsequent cases. With that, I think my time is up, but if there are questions from the court, I'd be glad to answer them. 
I had one quick question, Judge Gish. Um, Council, how persuasive should we find the ConAgra insurance case from California, which found that the defendant in that action had actual knowledge that the lead paint would uh, imperil children? And, and so the, the, the answer to that is simple, which is this case was not decided under California law. Our case is decided under New York insurance law. That, that's what Judge Majorly found, at least for this portion of the case. And that was what they briefed and what they decided was there. Judge Majorly made her decision. And by that theory, well, the California court should now go reverse itself because of the decision by Judge Majorly. That decision is up on appeal. It's not remotely final in any way, shape, or form. And there's certainly no collateral estoppel against NL. We did not participate in the ConAgra insurance case. Obviously, the insurers participated in this case. And whether Judge Maisley's opinion would be binding out in California for a reversal, which hasn't been scheduled for argument yet, um, that's all I can tell you. I can also say that that decision is just wrong. If you read it carefully, it has no analysis on why it comes to that opinion. It's basically one or two lines. And there's a specific California statute that is different than what New York has. And certainly one of the big differences is we believe our policies are very, very different than the policies that ConAgra had with the various riders that we had. Your Honor, may I begin my um, rebuttal? You met, you met, well, my, my co colleagues have any questions for Mr. Hurst? You may, Mr. Kravitz. Thank you, Your Honors, appreciate okay. it. First thing, as to ConAgra, um, they have the same public policy and there's no coverage if there's substantial certainty and they applied the same findings of fact, that's the correct, um, that is the correct outcome here. Um, second of all, as to the policies, they are all except for a couple of early policies, um, according to Mr. Hur's accident or um, occurrence policies, the early policies are occurrence policies because the occurrence is in the um, limit section. Um, and under the fortuity doctrine, the E and I requirements apply in all the policies. Let me address the um, the knowledge of risk point um, because I think it's important. Um, yes, the the um, opinion talks about um, serious risk of harm that might be to an individual child, but that was not the basis of this decision. The Santa Clara decisions are explicit that knowledge of risk can be enough for product liability, but not for nuisance, which is like promoting a known dangerous use and requires actual knowledge. The findings of fact here are clear as to what NL knew and had to know that lead paint in homes would poison, harm, and kill kids in the community, not could, not might. In fact, NL in the Santa Clara action admitted that, that acting with knowledge um, did not mean simply realizing serious risk but instead intending the, the consequences of their action or being substantially certain that they would occur. And then the, the last point I would like to make here is that uh, on appeal from trial, NL argued to the California Court of Appeals that the judgment should be reversed because they had been held liable um, simply because they had created or had knowledge of a risk and, and the court rejected that argument and said, you are not being held liable merely because lead paint poses a risk or even an aggregation of individual risks, but instead there was harm to the community. That is what NL was found to have known. And because that harm was significant and unreasonable, they were held liable for a nuisance. So I, I would say each one of um, NL's points are incorrect and we would ask that you rule for us on intent. Your Honors, can I just take 30 seconds to make two very succinct points? Y yes. Thank you. Um, just working backwards on the because of point, the only argument I heard uh, was that we're here because of the fact that there was alleged bodily injury and property damage. Um, but 
that was true in structural, that was true in Monroe, that was true in Rite Aid, it was true in all of the bystander cases under New York law where uh, somebody sought coverage for a claim that um, uh, the, a person suffered emotional injury because of a bodily injury and zero of those cases awarded dam uh, a coverage because it's never been enough to have a mere causal connection as Mr. Hertz asserts. The only other point I would make um, is on the, uh, on the damages issue, Mr. Hurst's brief makes a, a, a large fuss about the idea that there's uh, the, the was not awarded abatement. There was not awarded abatement. It was just money, not abatement. But that actually gets the decision exactly backwards. What the decision actually says at page 133 in the Cal App Reporter is that the court, and I'm quoting, uh, the trial court could have chosen to have defendants handle the remediation themselves after discussing abatement. Um, but such an order would have been difficult for the court to oversee and for defendants to undertake. So instead, it's uh, imposed money as a way of ensuring the abatement. It's just the costs. It's the exact same thing as the costs that NL itself would have, would have incurred had it been just ordered to abate, which is just practically, um, which uh, Mr. Hertz concedes would not lead to coverage because that's impractical. Um, they substituted the money for the actual abatement, but the decision makes perfectly clear that it's abatement, not damages, and therefore it's not covered. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, all counselor. Obviously, this is a very complicated matter, and uh, we will go through your briefs to again to the extent we already haven't, but thank you. Thank you. People versus Coleman. David Clem, Michael Yetter. Since nobody answered or nobody checked in on this case and nobody's answered at this time, I'm going to mark and submit it. Guzman versus AmeriCare. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Kevin O'Connor of Picard and Abramson on behalf of the appellants. Um, may I proceed? You may. Thank you. Uh, the, the grounds for appeal here are relatively simple. Uh, we ask that the court reverse the court's orders below, which effectively granted a motion for re-argument, a motion for re-argument which contained no new evidence, no real new, new arguments. And in fact, if you look at the record, there's nothing there. Um, and by which another judge, uh, a second judge, reconsidered the decision of the first judge and reversed. And before an answer was filed, um, before any discovery was taken, granted class certification, and granted class certification using affidavits that Mr. Rand obtained in a another action that he had lost on summary judgment. And I say to the court, as someone, I've been before this court on many of these cases, we do a lot of class action work. What's going on now is the plaintiff's bar, they're going out, they're finding affidavits from any other case they can find, they're putting them on the end of a motion and they're asking for class certification. So AmeriCare uh, provides home health care services to the elderly, the infirm. It was essential during the COVID pandemic. Without uh, companies like AmeriCare, we would all be in trouble because the nursing homes couldn't take them. And, and, and well as their employees, employees because... right? I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I said you said with that you were talking about the necessity of having you, the... Uh, defendant, but as well as the, the employees who were caretakers during that period of time, right? And so the dispute here today is about the people who work for AmeriCare and whether they were being appropriately paid pursuant to the apl applicable rules and regulations, right? Absolutely. So, right. so everybody, everybody's a good guy here. All Let right. me ask counsel, I was, I was trying to ask, is, aren't there now a number of cases finding that these type of disputes are appropriate for class action certifications. Uh, and, and there've been a number of cases where we've upheld them now at this point. So that seems pretty well established. And why shouldn't we then find that this was also proper? I'll tell you What's why. What's different about this case and the other cases we already found that is appropriate type of uh, dispute for class action certification. Excellent question. And that's where I was going to go. And in fact, I, I've, my firm was counsel in the 
in the uh, Marino case that went to the Court of Appeals, we were counsel in all these other cases. And the difference is this, there was an answer filed. There were, there were affirmative defenses that were made clear. There was discovery, there were depositions. It was an enormous record. Each of those cases had a record with depositions and certifications. Counsel, I understand that argument, but the, the issues in all of these cases are very similar. Because of the way the regulation is set up with this 24 hours, 13 hours, the big issue in these cases, whether or not to grant the certification, was were there too many individual issues based on what each individual home health care attendant did during those extra hours? And that that has been definitively answered at this point. It's discovery, no discovery, depositions, no, no depositions. We've answered that question, that that is not enough the fact that that exists to to prevent this type of action from being certified. So why isn't it appropriate then? Because in Andreeva, the Court of Appeals was very clear. The 13 hour rule is legal. You can pay people 13 hours with the assumption they're not going to work during the other break time and have a protocol to ensure they get paid for any time they miss. And we have a protocol. We have a live-in agreement, my client. And that is in the record. That is very clear. In fact, we won on summary judgment against Mr. Rand. So he took the affidavits of those employees who lost on summary judgment with a federal judge determining that they lacked merit completely. He turns around and brings them in state court and gets class certified saying that's proof that there's a policy that is in, in derogation of Andreeva. And it's just not right. I mean, class certification has very serious consequences to my my client. You're talking about re revealing the names and the identities and the addresses of 7,000 people having to produce records going back 12 years. It, it, it's like crippling. You're going to destroy these companies. We're trying to provide services, but it's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars just to comply with the discovery demands. And they're doing it without any, look at the affidavit on, on A98 and, and look at what she wrote about this alleged policy not to follow the law. All she says is, I worked uh, those 13 hours and I was often interfered with my sleep. And she says, she puts it in a um, very clever, hold on, because this is very important, page 98. She says, I was often interfered such that I sometimes did not receive a full eight hours. So that's not com that's not compliant with Andreeva. Andreeva says you get compensation if you don't get five hours of continuous sleep or more. They don't even allege that in the affidavit. The reason why? Because that affidavit was written years before Andreeva was decided. We ask that the order be reversed. We get a chance to put in our affirmative defenses. We get a chance to take discovery. The statute even says that a class certification motion shall be made no uh, within 60 days of the answer being filed. We didn't even file an answer in this case. So, and we deserve full faith and credit for the federal court's determination that the affiance in this case lacked that they that there was absolutely no merit to their claims. I mean, how can the court respectfully, how could the court say class cert is appropriate based on three affidavits by a fiance who lost on summary judgment after a full federal case? It's not it's not right. It's a violation of due process. It's not right to, to the employer. And your honor is right, Judge Gish. Gish they, they do deserve to be paid when they're not uh, when their their sleep is interrupted. My client has a full system for that. They call in, they report it. My client paid out over a million dollars in time I, that for interference. I, can I stop you for a minute? First of all, you're over your time, but I'm going to ask a question. It's like you're making lots of arguments and, and I look at what's in front of us right now, which is just class certification. You know, all the other arguments that you make about we didn't violate any policy, we didn't do this, we have defenses. Nobody, this doesn't stop you from raising those defenses. You, you're talking about full faith and credit. Is it full faith and credit? Is it res judicata? I don't know, but that doesn't, why does that have any bearing on the limited issue of class certification, which is in front of us now? Because the court, in order to grant class cert, has to determine that there is a policy in place that can be that's being applied across a class of people yet to have numerosity and 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 look at what they're claiming 
one person says well, isn't it true that in the underlying motion that you really what you contested was the commonality that was that's your argument and that was addressed by the court on renewal and reargument well, no, Your Honor, we we addressed with the court below that Mr. Rand was using affidavits from employees who had already gone through the full system and had lost, that their case had been thrown out. And we didn't think it is appropriate. And respectfully, we'd ask that the court address this issue because it is a problem. There are cases being filed right now using old affidavits. They find them on the Internet and they attach them to a motion. The courts are going to be clogged. Well, does that mean that they're false because they're old? It, well, it certainly means that my client proved, as a matter of fact, between the client and my client, that there was no merit to the claim. So how could a class be certified based on a statement by someone who lost? There was a final judgment, and they and they tried to appeal, and then they abandoned the appeal. All right, so, I understand your arguments. Let's hear from your adversary. May it please the court. My name is William Rand. I represent the plaintiff respondents. I'm going to interrupt you for a minute before you even begin your argument to say something having nothing to do with the arguments. I personally found it extremely distracting and disrespectful that you spent much of the time that you were on screen talking on the telephone. If while you're waiting for the oral argument, you wish to talk on the telephone, you should get off the screen because I was having trouble looking at the other people watching you talk. On the telephone. I totally apologize. So I that's thought for I, future I, reference, so. it's just not an appropriate thing to do. You don't have to be on the screen. You could blank out your picture, but if you're going to be on the screen, you shouldn't be actively talking on the telephone. It just, it just, I mean, this is a weird virtual world, but it felt very disrespectful to me. So this I is my first it. virtual argument, and I think I wasn't really aware of, that everybody's really looking at you. Um, so I fully apologize, Your Honor. First statement I'd like to make is I represented the plaintiffs in the federal action, so I did not go out and find affidavits from other actions. Those people were my clients. Um, they lost on summary judgment because the federal court said that the affidavits were not specific enough to survive summary judgment, and they had not given all the specifics of exactly when and which date and exactly which clients um, had caused them not to sleep, and therefore because they didn't have particularity, they could not survive summary judgment particularity of the affidavit, that type of particularity is not required on a motion for class certification. Um, also, he said that we hadn't pled because we said that they hadn't gotten eight hours. The rule is um, you're required to be paid if you don't get five hours of uninterrupted sleep or a total of eight hours during the 24 hour shift. It's an or. So if the affidavit said she did not get eight hours of sleep, that is sufficient to make the allegation. Um, so first, the trial court uh, properly granted the motion to re-argue. A motion to re-argue shall be based on matters of fact or law that were allegedly overlooked or misapprehended. See CPLR 2221D2. So here, the original trial court uh, did not realize or misapprehended that the plaintiff had not opted in to the federal collective action. Um, the trial court also misapprehended that the uh, state law class action alleged in the federal court had been denied because um, it was before Andrea Eva and the federal courts, despite the first and second department decisions, said that individual issues of fact predominated and refused to certify the class. So there was no binding effect of the federal action on the named plaintiff in this action. And on motion for reconsideration, the defendants did not oppose the reinstatement of the plaintiff's individual actions. Furthermore, the trial court found that the prior trial court had misapprehended the application of the Andrea Eva decision. Uh, the Andrea Eva decision, as you have pointed out, basically said that it's appropriate to have a class in this situation and that individual issues of fact do not predominate. And the prior trial court misapprehended um, that application. The, um, so what, and, may, and maybe I missed it in your argument. How do you respond to your adversary's argument that the affidavits 
from uh, part of the putative class, well now certified class, um, uh, from the federal action are, are from people who can't proceed as part of this class. Is that true? Uh, yes, that is true, but they're still employees and they are giving affidavits about the policies and procedures at the firm, at, at this company. Now, the fact that in a federal so, action. So you, all right, so let me, let me just clarify this. So you're not looking to make those part, those people part of this class. They're not part of the class that the plaintiff who is not part of the federal action is seeking to represent. You are correct because they have lost in federal court and that is a full dismissal of their state and federal claims. But it doesn't mean that their affidavit wasn't correct and the dismissal was for reasons uh, other than it was for the fact that the affidavit was not particular enough. The judge held that they had a high standard of proof and that they had to prove each uh, individual exact date and time period that they didn't get to sleep or else they would lose their claims. I don't agree with that decision. And, and that might happen here as well. That argument is still preserved for the defendant to make, regardless of whether the class is certified or not. I agree, because it's a summary judgment argument. It's not a class certification argument. Uh, they brought up the issue of numerosity, um, but they've waived any objection to numerosity because they did not challenge it at the trial court level. Um, also, the numerosity has been satisfied by the named plaintiffs affidavit and by the other three affidavits, which all say there were at least 40 employees who are victims of this illegal policy. Um, and finally, defendants did not submit any evidence at the trial court level showing that there were not at least 40 employees subject to these illegal policies. Finally. Um, there is case law out there that I cited in my brief that even um, information that is not admissible may be considered on a motion for class certification. So even if the affidavits are not purely admissible evidence, um, they can still be considered in addition to the named plaintiff's affidavit. Wait, uh, you, cases, your time has just run out, so oh. you, if you'd finish your thought and then we'll hear from Mr. O'Connor again. For the reasons I have stated, I would ask the court to affirm the trial court's ruling. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Mr. O'Connor. Well, first of all, Your Honor, the, the court, this court has already stayed the case below. Um, and so there is, there's been no action to, to certify the class. I want that to be clear. Two, um, he, he says that the summary judgment motion was solely on the affidavits. I, I would, I, uh, Mr. Rand and I are colleagues. I, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm sure not, you've done these cases against each other <laughs> quite a bit. We, we have respect for each other, but that is a misrepresentation. Yeah. And I'd ask you to read Judge Pauly's decision because it's based on uh, depositions that he took of my clients. It's based upon policies, it's about computer programs that, that are designed to make sure these people get paid. And the fact that my client paid over a million dollars to these employees for interrupted sleep. So there is no illegal policy. He determined there was no illegal policy. And the importance of those affidavits is clear. He, he says they're not binding, that that case is not binding on his clients. Yet he wants the court to use the existence of an alleged illegal policy in those affidavits as a basis to certify a class. And it's just not right. And respectfully, this could be the case where the court says, you know what, you can't just come into court with an affidavit from someone in another action where the defendant prevailed and prove there was a proper policy and say there's an illegal policy. Class certification comes with very significant consequences. And lastly, paragraph 28, it's on page 102 of her affidavit. This is the sole affidavit on the, on the motion that should have been considered. It says, it prevented me from getting five hours of uninterrupted sleep and or eight hours of sleep. That is not what Andreeva says. Andreeva says you have to prove a policy that ignored the interruption of sleep and an employee who was not getting five hours of continuous sleep. So even paragraph 28 doesn't meet the standard. The court should respectfully, um, uh, why am I blanking on the word? Uh, revoke, we, we, we know what you're looking vacate for. Vacate <laughs> the order. Yes, vacate the order. 
and send it down. Have us put in an answer and take some discovery. Thank you, Your Honors. Right. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Your Honors. Okay, the last case for oral argument today is Subbies against Pewaukee. Yes, good afternoon, Your Honors. Jeremy Wallison, and I represent uh, the appellant Luba Moshionsnik. Um, Mr. Chawaki, which is how uh, it turns out that name is pronounced, uh, is is a party to this litigation, but he has never uh, appeared or answered. Um, now, succinctly put, uh, the issue on this appeal is the following: If a guarantor agrees to a guarantee agrees to guarantee a specific corporate entity's debt, and then that corporate entity, with no involvement of the guarantor, merges with and into and out of existence with and into a separate corporation, is the guarantor liable for that successor corporation's subsequent Mr. Wallace, and you can see that the name change is not relevant. Rather, it's that it became a Delaware corporation or Delaware. I, that's you're that's what you're hanging your hat on. Thank you for the question, Your Honor. Yes, I fully concede that the name change under any number of cases is not the operative. Uh, is not the operative. And so let, let me ask you to focus on something in particular because a lot of the issue here is the way that this motion came to us. This is in the context of a motion to dismiss and the denial of a motion to dismiss, and the problem is whether or not. When a merger takes place, the the guarantee continues or doesn't continue. It seems to be a somewhat factual inquiry, which I, I'm wondering why you're pursuing this motion to dismiss argument rather than taking a little discovery and trying to make a summary judgment motion, which could maybe more appropriately address some of the things you're trying to to argue in terms of because there's no there's no absolute uh, black letter rule that one, if there's a merger the guarantee is no longer in place. You have to look at a number of factors to make that determination. So how can we do that in the context of a motion to dismiss? Thank you for that question, Your Honor. Um, respectfully, I well, let me let me uh, answer the question a couple of different ways. Under the Worth case that we cite right at the beginning of our brief, there is, in fact, a per se rule that a merger out of existence discharges the guarantee with respect to any future default on the underlying debt. The lively question, and I think- But how have you established as a matter of law, which is what you need to do for a motion to dismiss, that it's a merger out of existence on this record? Well, among among the ways that we do on this record, uh, Your Honor, my my colleague uh, from uh, representing Sotheby's does not dispute that it merged out of existence. Plus, plus, um, if you go to the various Department of State uh, records that are put in uh, in the record, and for example, if you look at record page 408, which is our New York State Department of State record, it says about that entity under current entity status. Let me interrupt yeah. for a second, because this is a practical inquiry. And the, the, the real issue, I think, that Sotheby's argument is that these obligations were incurred in 2008. They were incurred before the merger. They're not based on any new transactions or new occurrences. They're based on things that she originally agreed to. Uh, and you're saying, no, it's not. How can we decide that issue on this on this record, whether the merger really had any effect on the obligations on, under the guarantee. So this is sort of the continuation of the answer I was giving before. And so thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Uh, respectfully, I believe what your honor is thinking of is the Fair case, the Fair Brothers case from 1986, which is uh, the decision that Justice Maisley uh, relied on. And, I, and it's the decision that uh, my adversary, Mr. Cohen, is relying on. Um, it, that decision did not abrogate the Worth case upon which I'm relying. 
or upon which my client is relying. What Fair Brothers stands for and the way Fair Brothers and the Worth Corp case work together is that Fair Brothers says that merger out of existence is a sufficient basis, merger out of existence is a sufficient basis on which to discharge a guarantee, but then says as uh, as pertinent to the facts that arose in the Fair Brothers case, then says, well, are there situations short of merger out of existence where the guarantee also will be discharged? And in those situations or for those situations, Fair Brothers articulates this case by case approach. But it, among the reasons your honor can be confident that Fair Brothers does not abrogate worth Fair Brothers cites Worth approvingly twice and then says, in fact, right uh, toward the beginning of uh, right toward the beginning of Fair Brothers, it says and when it's going through its review of the law in this very sort of difficult area, it says black letter when a corporation principal merges into and becomes part of another corporation. So exactly the situation here. The latter being the successor or possessor corporation, which has completely retained its identity and structure, the liability of the guarantor of the corporation principal is discharged. This is not the Worth Court court saying that. This is the Fair Brothers Court, uh, the Fair Brothers Court that is saying that. And then that later goes on to articulate for other situations, not for the merger out of existence situation, but for other situations, goes on to argue or to articulate this or formulate this case by case approach. But Fair Brothers is absolutely clear that a merger out of existence by itself is enough to discharge the debt. All right, Mr. Wallison, let's hear from your adversary. Mr. Kahn? May it please the court. Um, with all due respect, I think that my opposing counsel has largely misread the holding in fear and completely ignores the underpinnings of the case. When I was preparing for this argument, one thing was fundamentally clear in all of the cases that we both are citing which is there's an underlying notion of fairness that really dictates how the courts decide these cases. And the facts in Worth were very different from the facts here. In Worth, there was a continuing obligation of the entity whose debts were guaranteed that, were ultimately, that was ultimately merged out of existence. And the court in Worth said that anything that happened after that merger out of existence the surety was not liable for. And that is fundamentally fair because that was a completely different entity. That's not what we have here. The very same debt, and the court picked up on this, that was entered into in 2008, that was the subject of the original agreement, is the very same debt that we are seeking to recover against the very same entity. This was essentially a deal between sophisticated parties in the art world, where a painting, a Matisse, was purchased, and the risk was being shared equally between Sotheby's and the guarantors and the gallery together. Now, what they are asking us to do and asking this court to do, which Judge Maisley properly rejected, is to find that simply by the fortuitous event that had nothing to do with Sotheby's actions, that they can evade liability despite Sotheby's picking up the, the, the entire bag for this case and get away with it. What's not fair about that is think about this situation. If Mr. Chawiki here felt bad for Mr. Wallison's client, Ms. Moshe Arnick, after she was fired and said, you know what? I don't think it's fair that she's on the hook for this guarantee. Without even letting her know that, he could have gone and done exactly what he did, engaged in this purported merger out of existence, which is not exactly clear the effect of that merger because it's really the same corporation with a different name in a different state. And had that happened, the result that Mr. Wallison is urging is that despite Sotheby's doing absolutely nothing wrong, and even though Ms. Moshiangenik had nothing to do with it, she could evade her liability simply as a result of that merger that Mr. Chawiki undertook. 
That is completely unfair, and it's contrary to the express terms of the VERA guarantee that she agreed to. The only thing that happened with the original obligation throughout this case was that there were two amendments, both of which were agreed to in advance by Ms. Moshionchnik. The latter of those two amendments was a forbearance agreement, which provides clearly and unequivocally that those monies that we are seeking to collect were then and there due from the gallery. And it also goes on to state that there is no waiver of any remedies, despite the fact that we're forbearing on those remedies at that time. We are not seeking to hold Ms. Moshionnik liable for the debt of a successor entity here. That is not what's going on here. We simply are seeking to enforce the very obligations that Ms. Moshionnik agreed to in the guarantee and for those reasons and the, and the reasons stated on our case, unless the court has further questions, we will rest on our brief. Questions, colleagues? All right, Mr. Uh, Wallison, you have two minutes. Thank you, Your Honor, and thank you, Mr. Cohen. Vis-a-vis um, -vis the Worth case and uh, the way my colleague uh, tries to distinguish it, let's step back and be absolutely clear here what the debt is that we're talking about. This is not an obligation to pay half of a net loss on the Chiwaki or on the sale of this Matisse. At the point we are talking about, by virtue of the 2012 agreement that Mr. Cohen alluded to, we are only talking about a simple instrument for the payment of installments every six months of $300,000. So in, two, in uh, sorry, June 30, 2015, $300,000 are due. In uh, December 30, 2015, $300,000 is due. Before those dates, there's no debt due, none, zero. And so this is actually on that basis indistinguishable from the facts in worth, where again, the underlying obligor uh, the under the underlying primary obligor delivers packages and is required to remit payment for those packages to uh, the underlying obligee. So in just the same way, the uh, the uh, the debt kept arising after. And so here the debt. Can I keeps ask a question? Maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but what was the three hundred thousand dollar installment deal for? What were they paying for? They, uh, so when the Matisse sold, uh, there was a net loss was. on that Matisse. Right. Yes, correct. There was a net loss on that Matisse. It was not due at that point. So the parties together, and again, not my client, Mr. Cohen's client. What do you mean? What, it wasn't, they, but, but the $300,000 installment payments was on account of the loss under the original agreement for the sale of the Matisse, correct? Correct. But the critical question, Your Honor, respectfully, is when that $300,000 payment becomes due. Before it is due, my client, as a secondary obligor, has zero liability for it, just in the same way that the surety in the Worth case had zero liability for any debt owed by the primary obligor prior to a default. And in my client's case, there was no default on the debt until 2017. And what is the entity in 2017 uh, that defaulted? It was this new Delaware entity. Now, let me just very quickly, if your honor will you're, permit. You're actually over your time. So what I'd like you to do is wrap your argument up. OK, your, thank you, your honor. Uh, let me just very quickly address the fairness point. Um, First of all, uh, the Fair Brothers case uh, addresses the possible gamesmanship that can be played here and is very clear that estoppel law and estoppel principles protect against such gamesmanship. Had my client participated in some way in the merger, which Mr. Cohen is not at all alleging happened, but had my client participated in the merger, then she would be estopped from asserting the merger per se discharge rule. Now, additionally, 
my Mr. Cohen refers to sort of commercial fairness and the parties being sophisticated parties. Our papers quote a Texas case where language is put into the guarantee that addresses precisely the circumstance that Mr. Cohen is talking about. It says the uh, the guarantee survives even if the underlying primary obligor merges goes out of business, is succeeded by a different corporation. That language was available to Sotheby's when they wrote this guarantee. They did not put it in. Instead, what they put in is a protection in the event that the underlying contract between Sotheby's and Mr. Chawakey uh, is amended or there's a forbearance. We're not arguing about those things. We're saying the specific thing that happened here, which is the primary obligors merger out of existence, uh, it per se cancels the debt and Sotheby's could have protected itself, but it didn't. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you for your patience and waiting for Thank the you. end of our calendar. This session of the appellate division is now closed. Thank, Thank you, you, your honors. Hmm.